Meet Umaru Chan, a beautiful and popular high school girl. She's kind, smart, and gifted with many talents. She's loved and respected by everyone around her. They all think that Umaru Chan is flawless, however. That's true until she gets when there's no one except her brother around her. She's a lazy, careless, and pocket-sized, spoiled little girl. Taihi, her brother and the breadwinner of this house, tells her to stop messing with the computer and eat her dinner first. She tries to talk her one chan into feeding her but fails, so she starts crawling towards the table. She crawls and crawls, and then she crawls again until she's finally at the table. But the food is now cold and she's not happy with it. She asks Taihi why he didn't make bread since it's Tuesday, but Taihi reminds her that it's actually Monday. Hearing that it's Monday, Umaru screams because Monday is the day when her favorite manga, Jun Piece, is available at their local store. She requests her sweet one chan to go and buy it for her. Taihi refuses, saying that he's already exhausted from work. He suggests she buy it tomorrow morning before going to school. Unfortunately, Umaru can't be seen buying a manga because she has to maintain her, oh, I'm not allowed to read manga reputation, although she still finds this reindeer character of Jun Piece really cute. She somehow got assigned a backstory that famous Umaru only reads intellectual books and books of poems in her library at home. Taihi still refuses to go buy the Jun Piece at this hour. Umaru pouts and shifts to plan B. She flies onto her bed and starts rolling and yelling for him to buy it for her right now. Taiyi is confused that a girl who is about to turn 16 is rolling around and throwing a tantrum over a manga. He remembers that when Umaru moved in with him, with him a year ago, she wasn't this lazy and selfish. So the responsibility to groom her falls on his shoulders. Responsible big bro gets up and puts his foot down to not cave into her childish demands. Umaru, who has already rolled her inside the bedsheet, wonders why the tantrum plan hasn't worked yet so she shifts to plan C with the cutest face ever. She requests her brother to please buy it for her. Big bro still refuses. All of Umaru's plans have failed so she starts yelling and crying until one chan caves. Unfortunately, Taihi ends up going to the convenience store. After handing her the manga, he makes it clear to her that this isn't going to happen all the time, so she needs to work on her self-control. Umaru responds to him by saying that she's busy reading the manga right now, so he should talk to her later. Also, he should have bought some chips for her when he was at the convenience store. Silly girl ends up getting her Jun piece confiscated. The next morning, her friend Abina asks why Umaru's eyes are all red. Umaru replies that she got in a little spat with her brother. Now all of her classmates think that Umaru has got a terrible brother. Back at home, Umaru is talking to the hamsters. Taihi asks what they are talking about and Umaru shares that the hamsters want to eat steak for dinner tomorrow. Meanwhile, the chubby hamsters are feeling bad for being used like this. Omaru reveals that she's actually trying to teach the hamsters some tricks for this video contest. The animal tricks video with the most views will get a 1 million yen reward, which will be enough for Umaru's gaming consoles and camera and stuff. Omaru's ambition number one is to teach her hamsters to bring stuff to her like her potato chips, so she doesn't have to get up. Umaru's ambition number two is to tame 100 hamsters into carrying her around, so she can move around with the feeling of laying in bed. She's now trying to convince Taihi to go and buy 98 more hamsters for her, but Taihi convinces her to buy them herself with the 1 million reward she's aiming to win. He remembers when six months ago, Umaru asked Taihi to buy her these hamsters and Taihi Refused at first, but Omaru's top-tier acting of being a lonely girl who is bored at home alone when her brother is at work made everyone at the store hate him. He ended up buying two of them for her. He walks into the bedroom and notices three chubby hamsters sleeping on top of each other. Later that night, Taiyi couldn't sleep because of the clicking sounds from Umaru's computer. He regrets letting her sleep before bedtime. The next morning, Ebony feels nervous while walking with Umaru because all eyes are on her, but Umaru compliments her by saying that she's also very cute. The exam results are here and Miss Tachibana Silfenford. Umaru's classmate and one-sided rival gets devastated over how Umaru beat her by one point after scoring a perfect 100, poor Ebonai got 28. During swimming class, Umaru effortlessly beats Motoba from the swimming team and shocks everyone. Poor Ebina is drowning at the start line. During the piano class, everyone is in tears from Umaru's heart-touching music. Ebina and Umaru walk back home because they live in the same building on different floors. Right after getting back home, 
Umaru squishes down and starts fast crawling down the hallway track and reaches her computer. She changes into her hamster hoodie and the gaming session begins. Taihi is surprised to see perfect scores in all the subjects from this small bread, reading a manga upside down on a ball. Everyone in class wonders what genius Umaru thinks while staring outside. They know it must be something ordinary people cannot imagine. Umaru is actually thinking about her cola plan for the day. She arrives back home with cola, potato chips, chocolate bamboo shoots, pudding, cheese codfish, and dried squid, an entire menu centering around cola. She thinks hard about what to pair with this delightful feast and ends up going with movie DVD and anime DVD. She dims the lights, gets as close as possible to the screen, and starts the movie. Starting with chips and bamboo shoots so she can enjoy both salty and sweet flavors. Just as her mouth dries, Cola makes a heroic entry into her feast. Now then, chips and chocolate are taken care of. It's time for the cheese and squid combo. She enjoys the sourness of squid and mildness of cheese with, of course, Cola. She ends up sleeping after the heavy meal. Sometime later, Taihi wakes up Umaru for dinner, and he has prepared her favorite steak for her. Unfortunately, Umaru is already full so she has to pass. The next day, Umaru and Taihi are playing a zombie game, but noob Taihi leads them both to game over. Taihi looks at the time and decides to go grocery shopping. Umaru tags along with a pout on her face. Taihi has no clue why she's angry. Even at the store, she keeps ignoring him and giving hateful glares at regular intervals. Taihi looks at his cart and it's already surprisingly filled with snacks. Even if he tries to put some back, Umaru fills it back with snacks. She's still angry at him, so Taihiri, I decides to cheer her up with an ice cream. Omaru digs into the ice cream, while maintaining an angry look, until the ice cream magic works and she gets all happy again. However, the ice cream falls on the table and she now blames Taihi for it. On their way back, Tai Sir remembers that he promised to stay at home and play video games with Umaru all day and that's why she's angry with him. He asks her if she wants to continue their gaming when they get home. Omaru nods and cheers up again. Taihi is still trash at gaming though. Taihichi gets back home after a long, tiring day and he's fully aware that the day is only going to get rough because of that little chipmunk living with him. Surprisingly, he enters the house and finds out that everything is nice and clean. Even Umaru hasn't transformed into her spoiled version. Taihi wonders why she's acting strange today and turns out that her classmate Ebina-chan is visiting, so she warns Taihi to shush about her spoiled version. Taihi steps inside and gets stumped at seeing such a clean room. Umaru shares that Ibina and her are having a study session. Taihi knows that Ibina Nana-chan lives in their building, so he thanks her for being such a good friend of Umaru. Ebina, on the other hand, gets really nervous around Taihi, which creates a chimney on her head. Taihi notices that even the empty boxes from Umaru's online orders have disappeared. He couldn't contain his joy. So he grabs Abina by her shoulders and tells her that she could come to their house anytime she wants. That way, Umaru will always keep their apartment. After dinner, Abina leaves and Umaru squeezes down and opens up her cola after surviving a long day without it. She wonders if Taihi is going to yell at her, but he tells her that he brought some takoyaki snack today. He doesn't want to scold her today after she cleaned up the place real nice to make sure her motivation remains intact. Taihi heads into the bathroom to get the bath ready, but turns out, Omaru didn't clean up anything and only threw it all into the bathroom. Meanwhile, downstairs, Abina and her chimney are thinking about how nice Umaru's brother is. It's Sunday morning now, and Umaru spent the whole night playing video games. Now that there's no one left online, she wonders what to do until her Sunday morning anime premieres. She drinks her morning cola and looks at how happy Taihi is while sleeping since he has been coming home looking like a zombie lately. She feels bad at how hard her Oni-san has to work, but that isn't stopping her from waking him up because she's bored. She tells Taihi that she pulled an all-nighter and now she wants him to play with her. Taihi, I refuses with his too tired to even fight face and tells her that he's going back to sleep. She generously decides to give her lovely brother a whole 30 minutes of sleep and then she'll wake him up again. Umaru then thinks of a master plan to convince her brother. She lays down with him and pretends to sleep in her outside face. She knows Taihi will be so confused about sleeping this way. A couple of minutes later, Umaru, who was plotting something heavy, ends up actually sleeping. They both end up sleeping till evening, and Umaru is now yelling at Taihi, 
for making her miss both the morning and afternoon anime blocks. A few days later, Umaru is walking back from school with Ibina when a lady hands them the flyer for a huge rock-paper-scissor contest. The winner gets a super big-sized Nicolumbus plushie. Umaru can't resist not having this plushie, so she tells Taihei later that night that there's an emergency and Taihei needs to accompany her the next morning. Taihei gets angry when he realizes that the emergency for which he turned down the weekend shift is actually a rock-paper-scissor contest. He tells her that she could have gone alone, but Omaru puts on her cute sister's face and tells him that she wanted to hang out with him. Taihihi realizes that he has been working a lot lately, so he should use this opportunity to hang out with Umaru. They arrive at the venue and seems like Umaru went to the shop in the south while making Taishi register at the contest in the north shop to increase their odds of winning. Poor Taihi realizes that he has been tricked. The contest begins and Taihi is now questioning his purpose in life. He ends up reaching the final and his opponent happens to be Abina Chan. Realizing that she's facing Tai He, the chimney begins working again. Tai Ishi wins the contest and now Ebina, Tai Ishi, and the chimney are walking back home. Tai He, he realizes that Ebina must have really wanted the plushie and now that Tai He won it, things might get awkward between Umaru and Abina. So like a gentleman, Taihi he gifts his prize to Abina. Just outside the apartments after Ebina goes back inside, Taihi gets ambushed by Super Saiyan Umaru who is super angry at Taihe. She was eliminated in the first round so she headed to the north shop and has been following Taihi and Ibina since then. She can't believe that her four eyes corporate slave Baka brother has given away the plushie. Meanwhile, Ibina is happily cuddling with the plushie. Even the plushie is blushing at being in heaven. A few days later, Umaru and Taihi receive the delivery of a package containing the Nicolumbus plushie that Taihi hired to buy for her. Umaru is reading the magazine when she finds out that the last Fantasy XV game is out. She orders Taihi to buy it for her, but Taihi refuses, saying that he just bought Wyvern Quest for her a while ago. Later that day, Taihi heads out for groceries, and turns out Umaru is also accompanying him with a super excited face. Taihi makes it clear to her that they are only buying groceries and he's not going to buy her the game. However, Umaru didn't come without a plan. She intends to throw a tantrum in public to pressure Taihi into buying it for her. They are done with all the groceries and are about to pass through the game section. Umaru is fully prepared and has even transformed into her spoiled version to throw a tantrum. Unexpectedly, they run into Ebina who always shops at this store too. Like a nice big brother, Taihi takes them to the food court so they can have lunch together. Moreover, he knows that with Ebene Shan here, Omaru won't be able to beg for the game. Omaru keeps giving hints to Taihi like writing game on his omelet with ketchup, but Taihi decides to ignore her and focus on Ebina, who seems to be using the bowl for empty shells as a serving bowl. Abina gets embarrassed and summons the chimney over her head. Omaru keeps sending game game signals, but Taihie is ignoring her like math homework. Omaru tries to get attention by trying to feed her big cute Oni-san but fails again. She ends up losing control and transforming into Li U Amru and throwing a tantrum. Taihi reminds her that Ibinia is sitting right in front and now Umaru is worried that her secret is out. Luckily, Abina was so into the delicious food that she didn't notice anything. They walk back home and everyone is smiling except for Taihi, who ended up buying the game. The next morning, Abina is waiting for Umaru downstairs while she thinks about how one year ago, her parents were worried about sending her to Tokyo alone. She got nervous, even though she had been practicing standard Japanese to cover her Akita dialect and buying trendy clothes so she didn't stand out. However, she still ended up becoming the center of attention everywhere. She wondered why everyone kept staring at her and found out that people were staring at her due to her mature body. She felt really nervous and rushed to her apartment. Outside the Yoshida apartments, she ran into Taihi, who happened to be the first person to look into her eyes and not anywhere else. Taihi introduced himself and nicely offered to let him know if she needed anything. Since that day, Ibina has respected Taihi a lot. Umaru is here, so the girls head out to school. Taie is also heading out for work and unintentionally ends up flustering Abina in the morning. The brightest student in class. Umaru solves the quadratic equation in class and is walking back to her desk when this blue-haired girl stands up and claims that in the upcoming midterms, she is going to defeat Umaru and take the first spot. That's because Tachibana Silfenford is the best. 
Sensei reminds her that there's a class going on so Miss Silfin sits back. While walking to her desk, Umaru notices the girl in the back with a menacing aura surrounding her, staring at Umaru as if she's gonna eat her. While walking back home, Umaru wonders if everyone is on their edges because of the upcoming midterm and Ibina confirms that even she is not feeling very confident. She even made a lot of mistakes in the last test. Omaru cheers her up by saying that everyone makes mistakes and that she also made the mistake of losing her student ID yesterday. She tells her that she only needs to calm down so the pressure doesn't mess up her test. Back at home, Miss Bright student Umaru spends the whole day playing games and not studying for a second. Taihi tries to make her study, but his attempts to open the eyes of his hamster sir fail. He tells her that she might not get good grades since the midterms have tricky questions and she would regret playing online games instead of studying. Umaru understands what Taihi is trying to preach, so she corrects him saying that it's not a game, it's an FPS. Later that night, Umaru dreams about being inside an FPS and having a tough time dealing with enemies, but Tachibana Silfenford tells her that enemies are not that strong. It's Umaru who's weak. Ebina claims that she's not very confident about dealing with enemies. Omaru wakes up from this nightmare, realizing that this FPS dream was actually about midterm exams. She wakes Taihi up to help her study. Taihirai is glad that the bug that jumped on him is Umaru and not Yukai. Intellectual break. Yukai is something that falls on you in the night and clings until you give it snacks to make it go away. They end up studying the whole night. A few days later, the results are announced and Umaru retains her first position. Silfin is not happy at being second again while Ibina is not happy because she didn't get good grades again. Umaru gives the credit for her first position to her Four Eyes home tutor. A few of her classmates talk about how Umaru excels in both studies and sports. A girl adds that Umaru also comes from a prestigious Doma family, and her father is the president of Doma Corporation. That's why Umaru is so graceful and everyone likes her. The other girl says that maybe Silfin hates her, but she corrects her that Silfin only wants attention. She's actually talking about Motoba-san, who keeps staring at Umaru. Everyone in class is terrified of Motoba, and it is rumored that she got in a serious fight with an older guy and beat him up. While walking back, Umaru talks to Ibina about Motoba Kiri, saying that she saw her staring at her once before the test. Ibina corrects her that Kiri has been staring at her for a while now, and lately, she has been doing it every day. Umaru didn't notice at all, and she asks Ebina if she's friends with Kiri, but Ibina states that she isn't. She only invited her once for lunch, but she refused when she realized that Umaru would also be with Ibina. However, Ebina still vouches for Kiri, saying that everyone might be afraid of her, but she thinks that Kiri is a nice girl. Umaru wonders if Kiri is suspicious of her, and she'll be pretty shocked if she ever saw Umaru in this chipmunk state. Umaru is picturing a whole story in her mind when Kiri chases her and Abina stops Kiri, and then Umaru settles the conflict like a queen, and they all sit on the big hamsters and fly to space to live happily ever after. Omaru starts playing games and it's 6 p.m. and she's feeling hungry now and since it's Wednesday, she knows that Taihi will stop by the grocery store and bring meat. She looks forward to eating steak. Just then, someone rings their bell. Umaru suspects that it's Taihi who bought so much that he can't reach his pocket to bring out the key. She opens the door in his spoiled version and turns out. It's not Taihi, it's Kiri. Umaru starts trembling with fear, whereas Kiri can't believe how cute this little human is. Kiri hasn't realized that it's Umaru. Umaru ends up letting her in and Kiri wants to say something, but she can't even maintain eye contact. She finally hesitantly introduces herself as Motoba Kiri and asks Umaru if she's... This is the perfect story for her. So without thinking for a bit, Umaru replies that she is Umaru's little sister named Kumaru. Kiri asks when Umaru will be back and Kumaru replies that Umaru doesn't live here, only she and Taihi reside here. Kumaru asks her why she thought Umaru lived here. So Kiri replies that for the past week, she has been following her home. Kumaru gets terrified and before Kiri gets labeled as a stalker, she brings out Umaru's student eyed saying that she only wants to return this. She has been trying for a week but couldn't find the right moment. Kumaru thanks her and Kiri ends up making Kumaru her master whom she is going to follow for the rest of her life. 
Taihee is back home and he wonders why Umaru is wearing her hood in front of someone else. Kumaru introduces Taihee to Kiri and just like everyone else, Taihee gets terrified by Kiri's menacing stare. Actually, Kiri's so shy that she's only able to talk to children. The next day, Umaru wins the swimming race again setting up a new record. Silphan is not happy at being second again while Ibina is again drowning at the starting line. Kiri looks at Umaru and finds her really elegant. Later that day, Kiri visits her master Kumaru again and thinks about her fantasy world where everyone else is a potato or capsicum while she alone is Princess Umaru's trustworthy knight who shall protect her forever. Kumaru calls her up so they can open the ultra-rare pack together. Kiri wonders if Kumaru can help her become friends with Umaru. She tries to ask her but ends up stuttering and letting it go. The next day at school, everyone steps away from Kiri's menacing path. However, Umaru approaches her and thanks her for playing with her sister. Umaru asks her if she would like to walk home together and Kiri agrees. Kiri can't believe her luck, but she's not happy with Abina's presence. Umaru introduces them to each other, but Abina shares that they have talked before. However, Kiri only saw a watermelon instead of her head at that time. Kiri gets embarrassed and runs away. The next evening, while playing games with Master Kumaru, Kiri shares that a rival has appeared that she must defeat. Taiyai brings the dinner and they all enjoy the dinner together. Kawaii Umaru or Kumaru is watching a horror movie with Taiye and is trying hard to not get a heart attack. Taihii is impressed because Umaru would always get terrified, but lately, she has been working on her footwork and punches so she's confident to beat the ghost up. Taihi steps out for shopping and Umaru hears a strange noise that scares her because she is the only one at home and she just saw a horror movie. The power goes out and each lighting bolt is striking years off Umaru's age. She's in tears now, but luckily, Taihi rushes back home and runs towards Umaru. Umaru runs towards her hero brother and this lovely reunion takes a surprising turn when Taihi ignores Umaru and runs towards the balcony to save the clothes from rain. Unfortunately, Taihi was too late and the laundry is soaked. Omaru no longer puts on a brave act that she's not afraid. Omaru is walking back from school with Ebina and all eyes are on her. Just then, she notices a new arcade and she knows what she has to do now. She heads back home, changes into her gamer, Umar outfit and arrives at the arcade. As she steps inside, all heads turn towards this girl with the menacing aura. The manager and the worker know that this girl is Amor who conquers each and every game regardless of the genre. She's the one who could claim any prize with a single coin which makes her the biggest threat to this arcade. They follow her and notice that Umar has already got her eyes on the Fukijin Nyankoro items they just got in. Uncle is worried, but Bro assures him that they have nothing to worry about because he arranged the prizes in such a way that she can never get them, not in a single try at least. However, Umar targets the tag hook and successfully wins three plushies in the first attempt. She moves on to the next target. Uncle is worried again, but Bro assures him that this time there are no tag hooks and he lowered the arm strength as much as possible. However, he is taken by surprise when Umar uses the high-level stab technique where the arm's claws are stabbed into the crevice of the box. Umaru then approaches Uncle and Bro and politely tells them that she can't see the prize she wants. She requests them to put it in one of the games. Her cuteness wins them over and they agree to do so. However, Bro and Uncle talk in their top secret eye morse code to make it impossible for Umar to win it. However, Bro is again flabbergasted when he sees Amir using the Niagara drop technique that breaks the center of the mountain of plushies and they all start falling like Niagara Falls. In the end, there was nothing they could do. Taihi comes back home and after seeing all these plushies, he feels bad for the poor arcade. Later that night, Kumaru sleeps with her lovely Nyankoro while Taihi has to share his space with all the rest. The next morning, Kumaru doesn't want to go to school, but Taihi reminds her that she has tennis classes today. Everyone loves how cute Omaru looks in the tennis outfit. Meanwhile, she only wants to go home and play video games, as they are practicing to keep the ball in the air. Silfin approaches Umaru with her charming portable background while her beautiful hair swings around. Thanks to her portable fan, she challenges Umaru for a tennis match. Everyone is excited for the showdown, and it's Umaru and Kurie versus Silfin and Abina. Silfin is determined to get the top spot, 
so she starts right away with her strong Canzone Silfin smash. The ball passes through Umaru before she can even react. Everyone thought Silfin got the point until the ball comes back with double the intensity and damages her portable charming background. That's because Kiri is exceptional at sports. Meanwhile, Silfin's partner, whom she calls Ebihara, closes her eyes every time she has to hit the ball. Umaru goes for a weak serve so Abina could easily hit it, but Silfin keeps trying to go for it and ends up in her portable background. Seeing that Silfin is going all out, Umaru also decides to take it seriously. Kiri has mentally vowed to protect, so she keeps sending the ball back before it reaches Umaru. Meanwhile, Silfin partners Ebimori-san and Ebikura-san keep giving away the points. The ref tries to stop the play, but the competition goes on. Omaru goes back home with a muscle ache. At Taihi's office, his junior, Alex gives him a gift that he got from his uncle in Europe. Taihi really appreciates the gesture. Meanwhile, Takeshi in the back feels sad over not getting a gift. Taihi opens the gift after coming back home, and it's a cat figure with a bobbing head. Kumaru doesn't like the porcelain cat, but Taiyi doesn't care about that because he's honored to get a gift from the junior he trained. Kumaru ruins his happy thoughts by saying that his junior might become his boss someday. Kumaru gets a well-deserved punch. Taihi puts the gift in his drawer and tells Kumaru not to break it. Kumaru states that she doesn't even like it in the first place. The next afternoon, she's playing pocket hamster GK, and along with her two hamsters, Metal Nyankos is also a part of it. Unfortunately, Nyankos falls down the table and shatters into pieces. Kumaru panics over thinking how angry Taihi would be with her now. Now then, Kumaru turns back into Amaru and begins the operation. Repair Nyankos. She needs to make sure it looks as good as new as if nothing bad happened to it. Being good at art, she decides to take her fate into her own hands. Using the internet's help and all the equipment, Umaru's precise operation becomes successful and she fully repairs the cat. However, she still needs to draw its face and she can't remember what this dumb bobby cat looked like. She explores her memories and turns it into Pikachu. She couldn't remember at the end, so she confesses her crime in front of Taihi. He calmly accepts her apology and tells her that he's not mad about her breaking the cat. What he's actually curious to know is how she bought all these tools to cover up her crime. Turns out she knows his pin code and used his card at the hardware store. Omaru is practicing her gaming skills, especially her combo 5 because she is planning to participate in the recent Plaza Gapcom game tournament, the same arcade that hates MR. She asks Taihi, to come with her. The day of the tournament is here and while Umaru is registering herself, Taihi runs into Alex who is also here with his little sister. The lights go off and the spotlight on stage turns on. Bro announces that they are ready to begin the Su4 number one tournament. Taihi is surprised at the intense atmosphere, so Alex reveals that this famous game has a ranking system and this tournament gathers all of the people who placed first at their respective arcades to decide who actually is number one. Gapcom Arcade's champion who stands on top is none else than Umar. The challengers are Uziar, JNB, DT, SJ, ESK, and lastly, TSF, who happens to be Tachibana Silfenford. Umaru wonders what Silfen is doing here, but then she realizes that Silfen always participates in all kinds of competitions. Upon winning, Silfen announces that she, Tachibana Silfenford, is going to be number one while poor bro tries to remind her that she shouldn't be disclosing her real name. Umar and TSS end up in the final and Umaru starts well, but Silfen realizes that her combo five is slow. So she turns the tables on Umaru, who doesn't want to lose in front of her brother. Silfen wonders where Umaru keeps looking and upon noticing Alex, her brother in the crowd, she panics, gets embarrassed, and runs away over all the embarrassing stuff she was saying on the mic. Silfin gets disqualified and Umaru wins. Alex then catches up with Silfin. The next day, Umaru wonders why Silfin ran away. Just then, Silfin pops up in front of her and announces that for today's academic quiz, she will defeat Omaru and claim the number one spot. Unlike others, Umaru doesn't think that Silfin enters all kinds of competitions just for attention. Omaru has again retained her first position meanwhile, our Ibina-chan came third, from the bottom. Just then, Silfin starts throwing rose petals at herself while announcing to Umaru that she won't lose the next time. It's the last day of school because summer vacations are starting tomorrow. The next day, Umaru is at the arcade playing a coin game while Uncle and Bro are worried that she's gonna rob them again. The people outside are being targeted by the sun, 
but Umaru doesn't have to worry about the summer heat as long as she is inside the air-conditioned arcade. Just then, she gets ambushed by Shepayan Silfin. Within 0.2 seconds, Umaru wears her mask so Silfin doesn't recognize her. Silfin tells Umar about her classmate, Doma Umaru, who happens to be her rival. Silfin states that her purpose in life is to defeat Umaru, however. Before that, she needs to beat Umursan. She asks her to play Soup Bay 4 with her, but Umar tells her that she didn't bring her controller. In that case, Silfin tells her that she will beat her at whatever she is playing. So now both of them are playing the coin game. Lucky Silfin hits the jackpot on her first try and gets 5,000 coins. Since it's not actually a real game, Silfin can't consider it a victory. Therefore, she gives away her 5,000 coins to this old man who got bored in his grave. She suggests Umar to play a different game with her, one that involves skills, so Umaru also gives away her coins. They play several games, but each time, it ends up in a draw. Umaru is impressed because she's good at all those games, but Silfin managed to pull a draw even though she's playing for the first time. She has no clue why Silfin wants to win so badly. But since it's important to her, Umaru takes off her winner tag and hands it to Silfin. The aesthetic rose petals are out again as Silfin celebrates her victory. Since their rivalry has now ended, Silfin befriends Amari and makes her join forces with her to defeat Omaru. Taihi is walking like a zombie under the heat while Kumaru and Kiri enjoy the blessing of an air conditioner and playing video games. Kiri makes more kalpas for her master Kumaru and Kumaru knows that she's getting more spoiled but it's worth it. She lowers the AC temperature to 19 and they play imaginary pool. Kumaru knows that poor corporate slaves like her brother are fighting the heat right now while she gets to enjoy her nice drink in a cool room. She ends up dozing off and Kiri is bursting out over Kumaru's cuteness. She's having cuddly thoughts so she pokes Kumaru's cheek and goes crazy with joy. She wants to preserve a memory of this adorable creature, so she tries to get her mobile to take a picture, but Umaru can't risk leaving proofs. Kumaru grabs Kiri and starts climbing her. After reaching the perfectly huggable height, Kumaru sleeps again and is overwhelmed Kiri falls to the ground and ends up sleeping as well while hugging Kumaru. She dreams about an exclusive beach party with her shisho Kumaru and enjoying the best summer vacation of her life. Taihi arrives back home and being the breadwinner of this house, he gets a mini heart attack at seeing the AC set on 19. He turns it off and opens the window to let warm air enter the room and teach his spoiled bug sister a lesson. Later that day, Amaru is playing games when she hears that her bath is ready. After washing herself, she sits inside her bathtub and wonders how others take their bath. For example, there are long baths, milk baths, quick baths, and finally, the bath she takes. Start taking notes as the list is a bit long, along with ice cups, potato chips, a manga magazine, and a waterproof gaming console. Umaru completes her castle. Being a productive and efficient gamer, she can't let even a second go to waste. While playing games, she likes to eat chips and while her game is loading, she reads her manga. Just as her fun started, the bubbles stopped and Umaru wants to put in more powder but the last time she did that, Taihi yelled at her and decided to keep them all in his drawer for safekeeping. Omaru wraps a towel around her and begins her heist. Taking advantage of her brother's focus on his work, Umaru grabs as many packets as she can and successfully returns to her bubbly castle. Inside the bathtub, she feels as if her time is passing slower and after a while, she starts feeling thirsty. That's when she gets out of the tub for her post-bath cola. She also has to drink her milk coffee after the bath. So she gets up to go to the kitchen, but remembers the water she left on the floor during her heist. Umaru slips on it, and all the cola falls over her. Now she needs another bath. The next morning, after doing laundry, Tahi notices that Omaru is wearing her hamster hoodie even though he just washed seven other hamster hoodies. He opens her wardrobe, and there are a million more hamster hoodies. He takes out his wallet and gives Umaru a 10,000 yen note. Umaru panics, and while immediately accepting the money, she tells him that bribes don't work on her. He explains that since she doesn't have many outdoor clothes, she can invite Ebena and Kuri and go shopping with them. He also gives her another order, that she should not buy anything other than clothes. Abina and Umaru arrive at the mall and meet up with Kiri who was dreaming about a one-on-one -on -one shopping trip with her princess. But now she's disappointed to see Ebenia here as well. 
Since there are so many shops, the girls decide to look at every shop and decide at the end what to buy. Umaru likes a dress, but it is way too overpriced. She could buy 60 colas at the same price. The shopkeeper finds Umaru really cute and offers her to be a model. Kiri notices this lowly person getting too close to her princess, so her menacing stare is enough to drive her away. The girls then try a number of clothes together, and after going through all the shops, they decide to split and buy whatever they like the most and meet back here afterward. Umaru has her heart set on that 60 cola dress, so as she walks towards the shop, an unexpected gaming store crosses its path with Umaru. There's the limited edition Monster Fantasy V on sale and Umaru wants to buy it much more than any dress. However, Taihi strictly told her not to buy anything other than clothes. The next morning, Taihi notices that all the clothes Umaru bought are a bit dull. That's because she went for cheap ones for the money left after buying her game. Taihi wakes Umaru up and reminds her that her summer break has ended. Umaru is really sad and shares her deep feeling that a person only realizes how precious something is once they have lost it. Umaru crawls to the breakfast table and asks Taihi where her steak is. Taihi tells her that no one eats steak at breakfast. Umaru dozes off again, so Taihi yells at her. He walks with Umaru and Abina for a while to make sure Umaru doesn't get back in bed and then heads off to his office. A usual day where he bumps into a person on the train, apologizes, gets to the office, consoles Bomber who is losing his will to live and helps Alex with his computer problem. During lunch, Bomber asks Taihi about the homemade lunch he always brings and if he has a girlfriend. Their chief is also listening to the conversation from behind the tree, and she is relieved to know that Tai He doesn't have a girlfriend. Later that night, Bomber wakes up at his desk and notices that Tai He has already finished all the work that they were both supposed to do. Bomber thanks him and offers him drinks. Tai He tells him to not mind it. Bomber then shoots his shot and tells Tai He, I love you. On his way back, Tai He picks up meat to make steak for Omaru. He enters the home and notices that Amaru is already sleeping. With a smile on his face, he throws Umaru and the plushie to the other side of the room to wake her up. It's already midnight, so Taihi. I tells Umaru to go to sleep, but she refuses, saying that she isn't tired. Tais is still puts her on the bed and turns off the lights. A couple of minutes later, Umaru turns the light back on, and Taihi is already sleeping. She pulls out her manga collection, and behind them are the hidden potato chips and her console. To make sure Taihi doesn't wake up, she puts an eye mask on him and continues her relaxing nighttime. She starts craving for cola and finds out that there's no cola in the fridge. She can't think about spending the long night with without her cola and blames her brother for not restocking her cola. Unless she reminds him, since the only other drinks in the fridge are milk, water, and oolong tea, Umaru decides to go and buy cola from the convenience store that is supposed to be open this late. She sneaks out of the house while feeling like a spy on some covert mission. She has never been out this late before, so it feels like a different world to her. She hopes that she doesn't run into some weirdo like this. Just outside the apartments, Umaru gets scared at seeing a monster in front of her, but luckily it only turns out to be a cat. However, her scream has now woken up Abina. At the convenience store, Umaru notices that there's only one person working unlike during the day. She sees a strange guy staring at some magazine with some serious thought. That's Bomber. Cola has now been obtained, so Colonel commands Agent Umar to return to base. Umaru runs back home while admiring the blue lights and starry sky. Just as she gets home, Taihi is already waiting for her at the door and starts scolding her for going out this late. He reminds her that she might run into some weirdos like this, so she should never do this again. The next morning, Abina shares that she couldn't sleep last night because of a scary scream. The next Monday, Umaru is seriously irritated that she has to go to school while her brother has a day off. While walking with Abina, Umaru shares that Taihi's summer break has a different schedule than theirs. Now then, Taihi decides to clean the apartment, but he already did that yesterday, and the apartment is still all shiny. After thinking for a while, he realizes that there's nothing to do, so he gives the floor another coat of vacuuming. Now Taihi is bored, and if Umaru was home, she must have kept him busy by telling him to buy some game or bring her chips or make her something delicious or read her June piece. Taihi realizes that he needs to do something on his hard-earned day off. 
Meanwhile, Amaru is sure that Tai He must be having a blast now that she's not at home. Tai He checks to Metter to see what his friends are up to and finds out that Bomber is playing games while Alex is busy with his sensual 2D stuff. Just then, he sees a tweet about chashu pork, so he decides to cook it. As it is being heated, Tai He gets bored and dazzes off. Amaru comes back home and wakes up Tai He. After lunch, Tai He checks to Metter again, and the considerate platform feels bad for Tai He and suggests five other people to follow to light up his lonely life. Taihi is working at his desk while sipping coffee, but his sister can't let him have his peace, so she scares him and announces that the rare titan that has only a five chance of appearing, Taihi has been unlocked by her. Taisi I turns back again, saying that he has a meeting tomorrow which is more important than her game stuff. Now they are both fighting over what's more important. Umaru keeps bothering him while he's working the next day as well and the day after that. And the day after that until Taihi comes up with a plan. The next morning, he suggests that they should divide the room with a curtain because it's weird for siblings to live in a one-room apartment. In reality, he only wants to work in peace. Umaru agrees with this privacy plan, but in reality, she only agrees so Taihi. I won't yell at her for continuously lazing around. They head out and buy a cute curtain and then set it up right away. Umaru is excited to finally have her own room. A couple of hours later, she gets bored of her private space and wants to show tons of game stuff to Taihi. She peeks into Taihi's room and feels illegal to disturb him in his private space. Taihi is also finding it strange to work without Umaru continuously bugging him. Umaru tries to sneak into Taihi's area and he realizes what's going on, so he tells her that the room looks too cramped and they should just open the curtains. The next day, the curtains were taken off again, and now Omaru is again pestering him. Kumaru is playing a game while Kiri is cheering for her. Taihi brings cola for Kiri and Kumaru and notices that Kiri is still nervous around him. Kumaru then suggests playing the game of life. Kiri caves in front of her cuteness, and Kumaru tells all the participants that whoever has the most money by the end of the game wins. Kumaru spins the wheel and becomes a manga artist with her first manga going viral, so she earns 10 million right away. Taihihi wants to live a decent life in this game as well. He gets the option to change his career and now Taihi is giving it serious thought. Kumaru's life goes well. She ends up collecting enough money to buy an island to create her own kingdom and become a lazy king. Meanwhile, Taihi I works hard as a salaryman and after getting his chef's license, he becomes an apprentice. He ultimately opens up his own restaurant with his wife, who looks similar to Abina and children to become a cooking papa. Kiri's life starts well with a professional swimmer career. She wins the nationals, but ends up slipping over a banana peel and getting injured. She works odd jobs, and after her health takes a hit, the god of poverty appears over her. Taihi feels bad for Kiri, so he closes his restaurant, and now both Kiri and Taihi, I have zero money. Kumaru motivates herself as well, and Kiri thanks Taihi and Kumaru. The next day, Taihi started seriously considering a career as a chef. It's September 26, Umaru's birthday, and she has a whole list prepared to choose a gift to get from Taihi. Taihi also has this day off and he casually wakes up and starts making breakfast. Umaru waits for him to realize that it's her birthday and wishes her, but it seems that Taihi isn't pretending to forget. He actually forgot her birthday. She heads off and Taihi tells her to be careful on her way home. Umaru is confused now. All her classmates wish her birthday and hand her the gifts, including Kiri-chan as well, who wins the title of Weirdest Gift. Umaru is still thinking about Taihei until she realizes that Taihei told her to be careful on her way home. Home and not school. So she rushes back home right away, ignoring poor Shupa and Silfin. She arrives home while Taihei is decorating the room for her birthday and now Taihei is feeling embarrassed. Umaru does her best to embarrass him as much as possible. Umaru also has a day off today, so she's lazing around playing video games while Taihi is vacuuming. She asks Taihi to bring her cola, and Taihi gets worried that she doesn't even get up to get her stuff. She then asks for chips, and Taihi, I asks her about this box lying on the floor and if he should throw it out because he's taking out the trash. Without looking at the box, she tells him to throw it away, and as he is leaving, she calls him again. Taihi asks what she needs now and she replies that she only wanted to say his name. Later that afternoon, Umaru couldn't find the Hatsune Migu figure's box, so she asks Taihi about it because it had various facial expression parts in the box. Taihi hesitantly tells her that he threw it out. Umaru doesn't care much about those pieces, but seeing how worried Taihi is about it, she decides to mess with him. 
She puts on her crying face and starts passing rude comments to him. Taiyi takes a ton of emotional damage and feels bad over ruining her figure. Omaru is happy now that Taiyi is sad. He won't yell at her for lazing around the whole day. Later that night, Umaru wakes up and notices that Taiyi isn't in the apartment. She looks at the figure on the table and realizes that she said too much to him. Taiyi comes back and Umaru climbs on him with tears in her eyes, asking where he was. Taiyi shares that he went to look for the doll he threw away, but he couldn't find the soon something, so the store recommended him this one. He asks her if it's okay and Umaru tells her that he was looking at the wrong place to buy figures. As they are about to head out the next morning, Taihi asks her again if she's sure that she doesn't need that Hatsun doll and Umaru reveals that she doesn't even care about that. Later that afternoon, Abina-chan and Chimney-chan invite Omaru and Taiyi out for lunch. She has some gift certificates for this Raymond place and wanted to repay them for when they treated her to lunch. Umaru is glad because instant ramen is prohibited at home. Including the tabletops and the lively workers' faces, the whole place is oily, which means the ramen has got to be pretty heavy. Umaru wants to try two different flavors, so she talks Taihi into ordering the second one so he can share it with her. Umaru can't believe how delicious the ramen is, so she mentally turns into Kumaru and wishes to enjoy it with cola. Abina finds Umaru's way of eating very elegant. Taihi he then tells Umaru that his red-hot ramen is too spicy for him. So Umaru and Taihi exchange their bowls. They enjoy the ramen and then head back home. Taihi thanks Abina for the lunch while Umaru talks to Taihi about how he can't handle spicy stuff. Ebina really enjoyed it as well, so she suggests having lunch together again. The workers at the ramen store consider it an honor that the whole place gives the aura of oil ramen. Taihi is having dinner with Bomber who is crying over his breakup. Taihi feels bad for him, so he asks if he can go home since he has no interest in these things. Bomber refuses, saying that there's something else he needs to talk about. After multiple interruptions from the waitress, Bomber finally shares his concern that he thinks Taihi is living with his girlfriend. He has multiple proofs such as Taihi doesn't date, doesn't go to mixers, doesn't go to girls' bars, and people in their office have seen him walking with the prettiest girl multiple times. Taihi tells him that it's only his sister. But Bomber breaks his confidence by telling him that no one goes shopping with their sisters. Bomber can't live knowing that Taihi is happy with his girlfriend while he just got dumped. He asks Taihi if he could come over after this, but Taihi straight up refuses. Bomber ends up following him all the way back. So Taihi texts Umaru that his co worker is coming with him. Taihi hopes that after today, the rumors will at least be stopped. Bomber is surprised to see a potato like creature sleeping on the floor, and Kumaru's cuteness has healed the wound on his heart. Kumaru wakes up and mistakes Bomber for Taiyi. She jumps at Bomber's head and tries to remove the bombed hair. Later that night, Bomber leaves and arrives back home. He ignores his sister's do not enter sign and barges right into Kiri's room. He tries to give his little sister a piggyback ride. Only now, his little sister is not that little and is big enough to beat the exploded hair out of him. The next day, Uma runs into Silfin at the arcade who shares that she wants to go to an old-timey candy store. They arrive at the candy store with broken machines which confirms that this store is indeed old. They head inside but couldn't find anyone working inside. They look around and Umar is amazed at seeing Cola Drinko, Cola Ramune, and Cola Gummy. Silfin finally finds something unique, a carrot candy. Umar has gathered everything she's going to buy while Silfin asks her if she has seen yogurts shaped like this. Silfin finally finds the yogurt that her brother used to give to her when she was a child. They try to call the owner until they finally see the sign saying that the customers need to yell Oba-san as loudly as possible because the owner might be sleeping. They enjoy yogurt together and head back. The next morning, Taihi prepares Umaru's lunch and then walks with them to the intersection. He again bumps into a person on the train, apologizes, gets to the office, consoles Bomber who is losing his will to live, and helps Alex with his computer problem. On his way back home after a tiring day, Taiji runs into a cat and ends up following it and walking him back home like an honest lowly slave should upon running into superior cat-sama. Taiji has now lost his way, but then he sees a poster that brings back old memories. He's sure that he has been to this street with Umaru, 
so he keeps going until he realizes that he doesn't usually walk around anymore. He can't even remember the last time he casually walked around. All he does is strictly follow the same routine over and over again. Just like last time, he smells a nostalgic dinner that reminds him that he wanted to go home as soon as possible the last time, too. He remembers that Umaru turned to him and asked him if he was hungry, but wait a second. Umaru never calls him Taihikun, so something is wrong. He walks again and runs into Cat Sama again, and as the cat licks his finger, he finally remembers that he didn't walk here with Umaru but his mama. Umaru notices that it's snowing outside, so she wakes up Taihi, who seems to be dreaming about petting lots and lots of cats. Taihi wants to go to the grocery store, but he gives up the plan, so Umaru prepares a seat for him to give him a good shut in time. However, Taihi e tells her that there's something else he wants to do today. He wants to bring out the Kotatsukun. Komaru immediately transforms into Maru with excitement to help as much as she can, because after all, it is for the luxurious marvel of a creation called Kotatsu. He tells her to clean up the mess, and Umaru starts pushing everything to a corner, but Taihi scolds her and tells his lazy chipmunk to put everything in their designated place. After a while, Kumaru again gets distracted by a manga. They finally set up the kotatsu, so Umaru immediately dives into heaven. To make it her perfect paradise, she brings out her consoles, manga, chips, cola, and the hamsters, so she doesn't have to get out ever again. Within three seconds, Umaru falls asleep. Meanwhile, Ebena enjoys mandarins in her kotatsu, while Kiri is trying to kick her bomber brother out of her kotatsu. Even Silfin is having a nice time in her kotatsu. Taihi also ends up sleeping and dreaming about cats again. Umaru sets up the Christmas tree, and after completing all the decorations, she is super hyped for Christmas. Many people might go out and enjoy, but not Umaru because there's no way she's leaving her paradise. She is fully prepared for an indoor snack party and waits for her brother to come back. Unfortunately, Taihi and Bomber are doing overtime on Christmas. Bomber wants to quit and remember the golden days when they were young and free. Taihi E tries to bring Bomber back to reality. While Bomber is looking at the Christmas outfit, he gets ambushed by Chief Kano, who calls him lazy and actually motivates him to quit as soon as possible. She takes a 180 turn and nicely apologizes to Taihi for the overtime on Christmas and on behalf of the higher-ups who rejected his superb proposal. Kanal keeps flirting with Taihi who just wants to end the work and go home. Omaru is looking at Kiri and Abina's Tamita, and now she's feeling lonely because she wanted to spend Christmas Eve with Taihi. Just then, the doorbell rings and she wonders who it is since Taihi already has a key. She opens the door and it's Taihi dressed up as Santa Kun along with Kiri who he ran into on his way. Kiri gives her master the octopus Santa gift. She brought and asks Taihi why he's dressed up as Santa. Taihi reveals that it's because of his co-worker. Umaru also receives a text from Avina wishing her Merry Christmas. They finally notice that Kamaru is also dressed up as a reindeer today. Meanwhile, at Motoba residence, Bomber tries to surprise Kiri as Santa, but unfortunately, she's not home. Some days later, Kumaru, Bomber, and Taihi are sitting in Kotatsu while they talk about the most precious memory of this year. Bomber reveals that for him, it was when he dressed up as Santa and waited for his sister to come home only for her to beat the Christmas out of him. For Umaru, it was eating Taihi's delicious steak and she wants to eat it again soon. She also wants to eat ramen, so they plan to go when Abina comes back from Akita. Kumaru thinks about how she became friends with Kiri as well this year. Bomber shares that his little sister is very violent and he thinks it's because she's shy around him. Meanwhile, the news broadcaster shares the live footage of a shrine where people are lined up to ring the New Year's bell. Silfen rings the bell first and snatches the reporter's mic to announce that she has done it first. Taii asks if they should go to the shrine later as well, but Kumaru refuses, saying that they have to count down in the kotatsu. She plans to stay awake to see the year's first sunrise. It's 11 p.m., so Bomber gets up to begin the preparations. Kumaru asks if they have planned for Samba to start the new year. Bomber brings yakitori, edamame, keikino tain, and beer to start the new year like mature adults. Taihi I appreciates the gesture, but he can't drink with Umaru here. Umaru doesn't want to spoil the fun, so she brings her own bringles, sweet bread buns, ice cream, and finally her drink, different kinds of cola. She even created a point system to rank all the cola. Taihi is not happy with Omaru's obsession with junk food, but since it's New Year's Eve, 
He doesn't want to spoil her mood, so he sighs. Umaru interprets his sigh that Oni-chan has given his blessing. A party begins and except for cola and beer, Umaru and Bomber share all their snacks. Bomber likes the combination of yakitori and chips while Umaru likes the meat and chips together. Taiyi tries to make her eat green onion as well, but his efforts are in vain. After a heavy party, Umaru ends up sleeping in Kotatsu and Taiyi lets her sleep and not wake up. Umaru dreams about her great year as the corporate slaves enjoy the beer on the balcony. The next morning, Umaru is enjoying the New Year holiday, and she wants it to keep looping. Taihi approaches her and reminds her that she promised in November that once the New Year starts, she will get serious in life and stop lazing around. She tries to justify by saying that she didn't specify when in the next year will she get serious. She begins cleaning, but Tai He tells her to leave it for later as they are heading to visit the shrine. They check their fortunes at the fortune teller stall and Umaru gets good luck while Tai He gets slightly good luck. They perform different rituals, visit different stalls, and finally pray at the shrine. Tai He gives her 500 coins which Umaru puts in her pocket and instead offers a cheaper coin. After praying and wishing, they walk back home while wondering how this year will turn out for them. Omariru still isn't going to get serious because she never specified a date. Let's go back to December 24th, but this time from Chief Kanaz POV. She headed to the office on Christmas Eve just to mess with Bomber and her crush, Taiyi. She asks Taiyi if he has any plans for later, but Taiyi shares that he does not, which means he's not seeing anyone. Bomber mocks Kano by saying that she's here because she has nothing to do as well. Taihi tries to shush Bomber, but since there's no one other than these three here, he thinks it's all right. He then gets a smack on the head from Kano. Taihi asks Kano if she wants to hang out with them like in old times since these three have been best friends since college. However, Kano doesn't want to steal their family time, so she turns down the offer and lets them leave early as well. Later at the store, Taihi is accompanying Bomber who's looking to rent something for Kiri. Whereas Kano is scolding the counter guy to look at her with weird looks because a woman renting a DVD on Christmas Eve is sad. The guys then rent Santa suits, and as Kanao gets ready to watch the movie, she receives a message from Taihi. He sent her a picture of Bomber and himself in Santa suit. Kanao lights up at seeing this picture and immediately crops Bomber out of it. Justice for Bomber. The disrespect is real. For the first time in her life, Kiri is in the kitchen with a cookbook and cookie ingredients because she wants to give Omaru cookies. So far, she's only wasting the ingredients. Bomber enters the kitchen and teases her thinking that she shouldn't go through all this trouble since she doesn't have any friends. He then leaves her alone and Kiri continues her mission. She can already see Umaru praising her and can't get enough of it. Unfortunately, the cookies get burned, but she packs them just in case and starts making a new batch. She decides to make some for Master Kumaru first, and the ones for Kumaru turn out excellent. She heads to her room to bring packing bags while hoping that Kumaru likes them. Unfortunately, her cookies fall victim to a passing dog. Bomber, who is a big fan of Delulu is the best Delulu, thinks that these cookies were actually for him. Kiri brings out her wooden katana and Bomber gets what he deserves. The next day, Kiri is all excited to give cookies to Umaru and the whole day, she tries to look for an opening. During break, she finally mans up to hand over the cookies but nothing ever goes right for her. She trips on the desk foot and falls on the ground. The cookies fall out of the bag too and are now ruined. Umaru still picks them up, eats the cookies and praises Kiri. Later that afternoon, Master Kumaru also passes her delicious cookies. Taiyi arrives back and Kumaru tells her that Kiri left cookies for him. Unfortunately, she left the wrong bag for him that had the burned cookies. The next day, Abina sees a homemade chocolate utensil stall and ends up inviting Omaru to her home so they can make chocolate together. Umaru opens the guidebook and after seeing how terribly difficult it is, she heads outside and brings her slave, Taihi, to help them with cooking. With Taihi comes Ebina's chimney as well. Taihi he notices how Ebina has two refrigerators and fancy utensils, so now he can't wait to help. Taihi explains the procedure and types of chocolate and reminds them to mix the most important ingredient, their feelings. Now, Umaru wonders who is the person Abina has feelings for. They are all done and Ibina has made a beautiful heart-shaped chocolate. She ends up writing deer on it, which would practically make it a love confession if she wrote Taihi's name under it. She panics while Taihi is confused over seeing Kakanotane in Umaru's chocolate. While talking to each other, 
Taihi states that he doesn't even like chocolate, so Abina ends up writing her own name on the chocolate. It may seem sad, so Umaru reminds herself that she also made chocolate only for herself. Umaru receives a call from Silfin saying that it's an emergency. Umar rushes to Silfin's aid and turns out she has finally found the Oriomo live event DVD. They have been waiting desperately for it. While exploring the anime store, Silfin notices the new Purikira merchandise that wasn't here before. Since she comes here often, Umar asks her to show her around. They check out different things from different anime and have a blast until Silfin notices a guy with similar hair to Alex and panics. She's relieved that it's only someone else. They sit down and talk about Japanese anime. Silfin shares that her brother loves them a lot, and Umar asks if they watch anime together at home, but Silfin replies that her brother thinks of her as a meek little sister, so she doesn't let him see her playing games or watching anime. Umar understands why Silfin ran away during Supi 4 final and shares that she also has a brother, but he doesn't play or watch anime. He only cook. Silfin gets excited over the similarities and suggests that Umar should also cook with him. She motivates her by saying that it's easy to fall in love with things that their loved ones. Silfin then runs off to home and later that night, when Taiyi's E gets up to cook dinner, Umaru follows him to the kitchen, saying that she's going to help as well. Taiyi wonders if Umaru has a fever or something. The next day, Umaru heads off to the arcade and just then, Kiri rings their doorbell. Taihi lets her in and tells her that Kamaru just left. While trembling with nervousness, Kiri informs him that they don't have any plans together. Taihi then thanks her for the cookies, saying that they were delicious, but Kiri stares straight into his eyes, saying that they were not. She grabs her bag and afterwards, there's an awkward moment of silence. Taihi wishes for Kamaru to return home immediately because Kiri is still nervous around him when she's not home. He gets up to get back to laundry, but Kiri misunderstands his intention and immediately picks up her bag to guard it from being snatched. It's evening now and Kiri finally speaks up and apologizes for accidentally giving him the burnt cookies. She hands him the good ones. Meanwhile, Umaru is finally back after robbing the poor arcade and leaving bro and uncle in tears. Taihi is about to scold Umaru for coming late, but she uses Kiri's presence to her advantage. However, Kiri also tells Master Kamaru that she shouldn't be out this late. Taihi comes back home after work and sees Umaru sleeping on the floor. He also sees the uneaten pudding on the table. The next morning, Umaru throws a tantrum over her empty pudding. She accuses Taihi of eating it, and Taihi wants to say that she must have eaten it herself, but he wants to set a good example by not accusing without proof. With that, the court is set up for the hearing of Omaru's jiggly pudding disappearance case. Taihi asks for evidence that Omaru didn't eat it. She explains that she fell asleep after Taihi left a message that he would be late. She had a snack party, which must mean that she ate it. But she still has leftover potato chips and since dessert is always at the end, it means that Umaru never got to the end. She turns the table around saying that he slept in his work clothes, which means he was really tired. Umaru paints a whole picture of Taihi nearing death and using the pudding to survive. Taihi decides to make pudding to jog their memories and find out who actually ate it. After spending a whole hour, Umaru asks why he made pudding instead of buying it. So Taihi -e replies that he promised her he would make it for her. As they enjoy the first bite, Umaru finally remembers the events that took place last night. Taishi, I told her that he's putting the pudding in the fridge, but she said she's going to eat it now. She asked him if he could make pudding while eating, and that's when Taihi, I promised to make it for her. Case solved, Umaru is the culprit, but she has no plans to confess. Umaru falls asleep while playing games again and catches a cold. Taihi puts her in bed while Umaru plots to get pampered by her Oni-chan the whole day, even though she doesn't feel that bad. To her surprise, Taihi gets ready and heads out to work. Umaru wonders why he isn't taking the day off to tend to his sick sister. But Taihi I claims that this time, she totally deserved to get sick. Umaru decides to ignore the cold to make her situation worse, so Taihi has to take a day off tomorrow. However, she gets all better the next day after defeating her lazy um virus. After doing her victory dance, she notices that Taihi has got a cold and fever now. She immediately calls his office and asks for a sick leave. She takes a day off to help her brother get better. She heads out to buy the things that will be good for him, 
But Taihi is sure that Umaru is plotting something. His guess is correct as Umaru wants to get back at him for not staying with her yesterday. Since sweating is good when a person has a cold, she picks up Tabasco to make him sweat with spices. She also picks the green onions are known to be most effective when stabbed with it. She runs back home and finds out that Taihi's condition is actually turning worse and it's not something funny anymore. She feels guilty for giving him a Maru virus, so to get her brother back, she picks up her green onion swords and steps into the viral realm to kick their butts. She stabs each and every virus until they leave her brother. Later that day, Tai Hye wakes up with a green onion tied to him and Umaru sleeping by his side on the floor. He thanks her for taking care of him. Umaru is so not happy with the dinner Tai Hye, prepared because she wanted a hamburger steak. She still manages to eat everything except for the green peppers. Tai Hye I knows that Umaru always ignores the vegetables. So he says that he chops them up to change the seasoning for her, but she claims that it's much less effort to not cook them at all. She finally eats one and gives a dramatic reaction. The next morning, Umaru asks Taihi if he put green peppers in her lunch and Taihi lies, saying that he didn't. During lunch, Silfin announces that she finished the lunch first while Ibina and Umaru talk about who prepared the lunch. Umaru claims that she makes both her and her brother's lunch Kiri wants to join in their conversation but couldn't do to a lack of confidence. Umaru opens the lunchbox and it's hamburger steak with green peppers engraved in it. Abina praises Umaru as she knows how time-consuming it is to make hamburger steak with green peppers in the morning. Umaru feels bad for Taihi and later that night. She greets Taihi with Umaru Dive and tells him that there were green peppers in her lunch today. She tells him that she knows how much work it is so he can just give her stir-fried peppers from now on. Taihi is not used to her being nice, so he asks if she ate something weird. Umaru responds to the insult with another Yumaru dive. She's enjoying the video of Nasuyu's weird dance moves and praising the internet that is connecting her to the whole world without even going out. While rolling, she bumps into the cola bottle and ends up spilling it. While cleaning the floor, she finds a strange device under Taihi's desk. Suddenly, the glowing lights on the modem turn off and Umaru realizes that she just destroyed the internet device. To fix the device, she decides to look for help at Yapu answers, but she can't access Yapu without the internet. She can't use her iPad or computer, so now she's panicking at losing connection with the world. She decides to play games to calm herself but again, no internet, no gaming. She feels like she has been imprisoned. Taehee and Bomber arrive home only to find Umaru with a chimney. Since they can only get it fixed tomorrow, Bomber tries to cheer her up by copying Nasu, but fails miserably. He then puts the eye mask on Tehei and now both the children can't stop laughing. Afterward, they play cards with Umaru's revised rules involving Joker's revolution. They end up having a good time together. The next day, Umaru arrives at the manga cafe. Since they won't be having internet until the device is fixed, Omaru threw a tantrum to make Taihi pay for her first ever trip to a manga cafe. She chooses the seven hours long package and feels like this small room is her own secret base. She can freely use the internet, read as many mangas and drink as many drinks, so it truly is heaven for her. She brings out her hamster hoodie and enjoys her massage chair. She feels like she could live here forever but only after a couple hours, she gets bored of the loneliness. She still has four hours remaining, but she leaves and runs back home so she can enjoy her secret base with Ani Ai Chain in it. Ten years ago, Tai Sai used to be the brightest student in class, while Kana still had a crush on him and Bomber would, as always, get dissed. Since the test is over, Kana suggests going to the arcade. Just her and Taihi, not Bomber because he only got 15 and he should go home, study hard and shoot for 20. All three head to the arcade where Kana finds this cat plushy weird, but when she sees that Taihi, I likes it, her perspective switches sides. With a winning pose, Bomber claims that they need to aim for the neck to win the plushie. He tries, fails, and starts hitting the machine. Kanal claims that she has figured it out that they shouldn't lift it, instead they should push the plushie to make it fall. She tries, fails, hits the machine, and then hits Bomber as well. Taihin A notices that the plushies are tangled together and figures that they should aim for the tag. Taihi tries and succeeds in winning three plushies. He ends up giving one to each and Bomber again shoots his shot and tells him I love you. 
He gets slammed by Kanao's bag in return. Tai'i returns home to his cute little sister and asks her if she has been a good girl today. Umaru claims that she was, so he gives her the cat plushie he won. Ten years later, Umaru is still the same size and is winning many more plushies. She is still treasuring the one from ten years ago, though. Umaru is going through different pamphlets, and she finally sees one for pizza and orders her slave brother to get a pizza for lunch. Taihi refuses, saying that she should eat more vegetables. Just then, Ebenechan rings the doorbell and shares that her parents sent him some Akita Komachi, so she wants to share this rice with them. Just then, they hear Ibina's stomach growling, so while she tries to hide her embarrassment, Taihi suggests having lunch together. All four of them. Taihi, Umaru, Ebina, and Chimney. Taihi wants to use this opportunity to show Umaru how tasty traditional food is. Ebina shares how it makes her happy to be able to eat a home-cooked meal with others like this. Just then, Taihi brings the delicious lunch. Ebina is excited whereas Umaru is not happy with this many vegetables. She still thinks about how pizza would have been much better. Just as she takes the first bite, she realizes how tasty it is. Ebina also finds it so tasty that her Akita dialects even after finishing lunch, Abina is still a bit hungry, so Umaru suggests ordering some pizza. Taihi doesn't seem to be in favor, so Abina asks if they could order half-sized pizza. The girls then enjoy the whole pizza for themselves. Taihi, the Bomber, and Alex are about to present another proposal, and so far, none of their proposals have ever passed. Meanwhile, Umaru is at the store trying to pick up the right snacks. Since she couldn't decide, a round table conference with all versions of Umaru began. One, Umaru suggests chips, but everyone turns down her proposal. Another, Umaru suggests the brand new cucumber crackers, but this other Umaru thinks that chocolate is better than some cucumber stuff. A few Umaru start fighting among themselves. Another, Umaru suggests cake, but everyone else thinks that cake is the least appropriate thing for this occasion. After a bit more fighting, number 7 Omaru suggests something that gives energy. Taihi gets back home and Omaru presents her with a snack all the Umarus chose and praises him for the good work with meeting. Taihi is surprised to hear that Umaru believed in him. He shows her that for the first time, his proposal finally passed the meeting. All the Umarus are shocked because the purpose of that roundtable conference was to decide what snack would be best to cheer up Taihi after his proposal fails as always. In that case, the Umaru with the cake suggestion was the best. The next day, Umaru tells Ebina about how Taihi is super happy over his proposal getting accepted and shares with her the plans for the coming Sunday. Ebina is glad to celebrate with them, but she needs to make sure her tummy doesn't rumble again. They head to a nice restaurant, and now Ebina is confused because she wants the biggest parfait, but to keep herself from the embarrassment, she tells Umaru that she will have whatever she's having. Umaru orders exactly what Ibina wanted and Taihi. I wonders if these little girls can actually finish it. However, Umaru tells him that this here is nothing and they might have to order seconds. Taihi I doubts it and is really shocked when the girls actually finish the delicious parfait. Ebina feels more comfortable after seeing that it's not only her, Umaru also loses her composure at seeing delicious food. After finishing it, the girls actually ask for the second. It's raining heavily and Umaru hates the rainy season. Even her chips have gone soggy and this humidity makes her feel like she can't do anything. Taihi I wonders when she ever does anything. He keeps staring at this tiny bug going crazy in his home. Just then, he looks at the other side and gets terrified at seeing Kairi here. He has no idea how long Kiri has been sitting here. Kiri also hates the rainy season due to some childhood trauma. He tries to cheer them up by making them focus on the soothing rain sounds, but the girls couldn't care less. He then changes his approach and gives them something to look forward to. He suggests going to the ocean since the summer will be here after the rain clears. Kiri is super excited, whereas Umaru is not so excited because she doesn't like the tiring train journey. In that case, Taishi decides to ask Bomber to drive them. Kiri asks about this bomber and if he's a human. Taihi shares that bomber is his friend. Omaru doesn't want summer to come because of the heat, but Taihi emphasizes that the heat is what will make her ice cream taste better. Now, these simple-minded creatures are all hyped up for summer. The next morning, Taihi wakes Umaru up because the clouds have cleared and summer is here. Omaru is smart, beautiful, athletic, and a perfect high schooler. That's what everyone except Taihi thinks. Umaru and Abina are done with shopping, so on their way back, they decide to have some snacks. 
Ebina enjoys her cream sandwich while Omaru enjoys the ice cream. At the arcade, Umar and Silfin manage to win two ice creams with a single coin, leaving Bro and Uncle in tears again. As Silfin starts eating her ice cream, Umaru gets uncomfortable and tells her that she's not doing it right. She corrects her way of eating cup ice cream, and that is by licking the lid first. Now the girls eat the cup of ice cream exactly how it should be eaten. Kumaru is really enjoying the summer in her air-conditioned room on a beach chair with her hamsters while Kairi swings the fan and the TV shows a penguin documentary. She tells Kairi to enjoy the ice cream as well since she bought plenty. She has a whole separate cooler to keep ice cream close to her. Just then, Umaru finishes her ice cream and she wins the lucky stick that will get her another ice cream. She gives the credit for this victory to her everyday hard work. Taihi makes desert parfait with shaved ice for Umaru, and she can't believe how superbly talented her brother is. Taihie continues that her sister is different from the outside world, but when she's home, she's a selfish and clumsy girl. Unfortunately, Taihi Hai finds the ice cream cooler that Umaru has been hiding all this time. Umaru is watching an ad on TV where a family is on a tour, and this boy looks at the elephant and says that it's really big. He looks at the whale and says that it's really big, he looks at the dinosaur and says it's really big. He looks at Titan and says it's really big. He goes into his parents' bedroom and says it's not big. His father suggests going on a drive in their big, big decantia, a car just as big as a house. Amaru thinks about how convenient it would be if she could stay in bed and go to school in her decante. She tells Taihi that since he has a license, he should get a car now. Bomber told her that Taihi got a perfect score in driving school. She convinces him by saying that he promised to take her to the ocean, and since this is the first time Omaru is talking about an outdoor activity, Taihi agrees. They arrive at the store where the over-enthusiastic salesman is trying his best to pressure Taihi while Umaru is taking a closer look at the decante. One thing Umaru ignored is that this car costs 3 million yen. Omaru convinces Taiyi to consider a bigger car by saying that Ibina, Kairi, and Bomber will also get to travel in it. Taiyi likes how Umaru is thinking about others when actually she's not. The salesman let them have a test drive. Umaru turns into Kumaru and makes the back seats into her bed. She loves the TV as well. She can already see her going everywhere in it. However, her expectations are far from reality because Taiyi is driving as if Dekanti is not a car but his grandma with wheels. He loses himself when a cat comes in front of him and he only has a couple hours to react. Umaru realizes that driving is not for her brother. Turns out Taihi only got a perfect score on a written test. Taihi asks Bomber about the ocean plan and he's totally on board. Kairi is also looking forward to it, however. Umaru is now having double thoughts. She wants to go to Hawaii. Taihi reminds her that it's only going to be one one-day tour. She's just trying to hide how excited she is. They prepare everything beforehand and go to sleep so they can wake up fresh and early. The next morning, Kiri is already outside wondering where her master Kumaru is while Taihi tells Bomber to pick them up in front of the apartment. Ebina and her chimney are ready as well and now Kairi is getting nervous. Bomber finally arrives and Kairi can't believe that Bomber is actually her brother. She hides her face under her big luffy hat while Bomber is distracted by Ebina's big personality. Bomber gets stunned at seeing Umaru for the first time and asks who she is. Both the Matabes have no idea that the girl they always hang around is actually Umaru. Taihi Kai is confused for a while since he thinks both the sisters have the same name, but then he uses his big brain to figure out something and make sense of it. Like Taihi's father married more than once or something. Kiri wants to ask where her master is because they plan to go to the aquarium together. She calls Taihi's name, and when Taihi asks Kiri, what is it? Bomber gets surprised at hearing that this girl has the same name as his sister. His big brains conclude that it's just a coincidence. Kairi is now mad at this weirdo with crazy hair for making her uncomfortable. Umaru realizes that Kiri wants to ask about Kumaru, so she decides to talk to her about it when she's alone with her. They enjoy the beautiful scenery of the ocean and head to the island. They walk around Inoshima, visiting different places, ringing the love bell, and much more. They enjoy a luxurious lunch and eat whatever they want. Kiri notices Bomber staring at the girls, so she honors him with a quick punch. Bomber uses his big brain to think that it is God setting him straight. Kiri asks Umaru why Kumaru didn't come. 
After thinking for a while, Umaru is about to confess the truth when Bomber gets attacked by black kites because his head looks like a nest. Kairi tells Umaru that this idiot is actually her brother. She changed her hair a bit, and this Baka hasn't even realized that it's his sister. She shares that when he tries to pick on her at home, she always hits him. Back when he showed up at the entrance ceremony instead of her mother, she ended up hitting him again. That's why it was rumored that Kiri got in a fight with an older boy and since then, everyone started fearing her. Kairi adds that thanks to Taihi and Kumaru, she is able to speak much more than before. Amaru then takes her to the aquarium and tells her that Kumaru told her Kairi wanted to visit the aquarium and that she was not there because something urgent had come up. Kairi is glad that Kumaru is fine. Just then, Bomber shares that he should have brought his sister here because she loves fish. He shares that she doesn't talk to him since he went to her entrance ceremony and thinks that he shouldn't have gone there. Kiri is about to speak up when Abina tells him that there's no way any little sister would hate her brother. Bomber tears up and just when Kiri is about to have some respect for him, he wishes Abina to be his sister instead of Kiri. Kiri then knocks Bomber out. The girls head into the water to have the best time of their lives. There's another person enjoying the ocean, and it's Silfin who's here with her brother. They can't see him because he's on a yacht right now. Silfin wants to play beach games to decide who is number one, but Umaru suggests playing without competition, just for the sake of having fun. Silfin likes the idea. The girls play several games together, and with that, their amazing ocean trip comes to an end. Bomber didn't regain consciousness till he had to drive them back. The next day, Taiyi comes back from work and asks Umaru if she wants to go to the mountains next. But Umaru replies that only if he promises to carry her up and down the mountain. She then calls him out for forgetting her Jun piece and successfully manages to trigger her poor brother. With that, the story of a corporate slave and his spoiled sister continues as usual. Omaru is playing on her console while the hamsters rest on her head, and Taihi packs his stuff for an overnight stay on his day off. Umaru is not happy with his corporate slave brother, who sells his soul, but Taihi assures her that he will get time off in exchange. He reminds her that the summer vacation is over, and even though it's Sunday tomorrow, she shouldn't stay up too late. Later that midnight, Umaru realizes that her brother is gone, so she's finally free to mess around as much as she wants. Taihi would keep bugging her to go to sleep, but not tonight. She can freely burn through all her games for the night is dark and full of games. After putting some hard work into her games, she feels hungry. So she rolls to the fridge as she remembers that Taihi put some breakfast for her in the fridge. Unfortunately, her breakfast has stir-fried peppers on it, so Umaru decides to settle for the cup ramen. She could imagine how angry it would make Taihi if he was to see her eating cup noodles so late at night. Cup noodles are followed by potato chips and her favorite cola. She doesn't have to lower her excited voice or eat the chips one by one or take small sips because Taihi isn't here and she's free. She has the freedom that Eren fought for. She feels like she has everything in the palm of her hand. She feels like she could fly in the sky. Just then, she notices the time and realizes that it's already 3 a.m. She isn't surprised because time passes quickly when one is having fun, so she turns on the TV to see the late night anime. She falls asleep and after some time, she wakes up with Taihi's voice in her dream, telling her that it's already morning. Umaru looks at the clock and it's 8 p.m. already. She has been sleeping for 16 hours straight. Taihi arrives back home and notices Umaru standing outside. He asks what she's doing here, so Umaru replies that she's trying to get back some of the time she burned through. She greets her Wani-chan with a smile and they head back inside. The next Sunday, Taiyi is ready with his tiny cap and tells Umaru to get up. Umaru doesn't want to participate wherever they are going, but Taiyi tells her that the landlord might find her absence strange and he might not see Umaru as a nice girl anymore. Umaru ends up going with him. They run into the landlord downstairs who appreciates Taiyi and Umaru for coming since his back is not so good anymore and he can't do this by himself. Umaru wants to head back now that the landlord has seen her, but Taiyi leads her to the backyard where Ebina is already present. Upon seeing Taihi, Ebina's chimney joins them as well. Ebina is glad to see them here and Taihi praises her for already clearing some of the backyard by herself. Ebina guides Umaru that it's better to pull the plants by hand so they don't grow again anytime soon. Umaru tries a few and begins enjoying it. She sees a giant weed in front and her gamer mode switches on, 
thinking that this giant weed must be the middle boss before anyone could tell her that these types are plucked easily. Umaru ends up putting a lot of force, hence getting rolled back to the wall. Umaru starts crying and asking to go back home, so Taihi apologizes for dragging her out in this heat. However, Omaru notices how hard Abina is working, so she decides to give up her clumsiness and lend a hand. After clearing the whole backyard, they enjoy some drinks to cool off. Umaru wonders if Ebena is red because of the heat stroke, but she doesn't know that her corporate slave brother is the actual reason. Silfin meets up with her bestie, Umar, and informs her that there's a football match coming up, so she wants Umar to practice with her. Umar impresses Silfin with her Brazilian potato chips move, so Silfin requests Umar to teach her some skills. Umaru agrees and the teaching session begins. Umaru guides Silfin physically and mentally and shows why she would have been a perfect cast for Blue Lock. The next day, Umaru is ready for the match, while Kiri is reminding herself that she needs needs to protect Umaru, no matter what cost she has to pay. Abina is nervous and a bit sad because she isn't on Umaru's team. The teams are led by P-toppers, so the green team is led by Umaru, while the captain of the red team is Silfin, who makes a dramatic ballsy entry to the field. She claims that through football, she is finally going to defeat Umaru. At remembering Umaru's tips, Silfin dribbles by the whole team like Messi and shoots a power shot Ronaldo to get an early lead. However, Kiri unleashes her Ramos and deflects the ball to Umaru, who tries to counterattack right away, resulting in a deadlock between Silfin and Umaru. Silfin overpowers Umaru and scores a banger. Some minutes later, Umaru scores the equal. The game goes on and Kiri gets the ball. She fires up on hearing Umaru cheering for her, so she takes a blind shoot, but the football bounces off another ball to deflect into the net. Team Umaru has entered the zone, and they are not backing down. Silfin remembers that she has to trust her teammates, so they enter the zone as well. El Clasico ends in a victory for Team Umaru. Kiri will be faded. Umaru will be sainted. Umaru has just shaken hands with Paradise. Silfin feels sad for losing after giving her everything. Umaru notices Silfin and sees Mape in her, so just as she is about to console her, Team Red circles around Silfin and praises her for her incredible performance. With that, the football match comes to an end, so Silfin asks Umar to teach her volleyball since the volleyball tournament is up next. Omaru is not happy with this unrealistic anime, where the girls become friends just by greeting each other. In reality, it's much more complex, as she explains to Taihi that asking someone to hang out is way too much pressure, and if the person declines, a heartbreak is inevitable. Taihi tells her that if she doesn't try, she will regret it later. So Omaru asks Taihi if he had a lot of friends when he was in high school. Now Taishi is hiding his face. The next day, Umaru notices that classmates are much more comfortable talking with Kiri and Silfin and wishes to be able to talk to people first. It has always been others talking to her first, and she has never initiated a conversation first. After school, Ibina talks about how she wants to get better at football, and she appreciates Silfin for passing the ball to her despite her mistakes. She shares that she wanted to talk to Silfin after the match, but she left saying that she had to talk to a friend. Ebena talked to Kiri first as well, and even though she felt bad when Kiri said no, she felt that she would regret it if she didn't try. Umaru turns around to look for Silfin, but turns out that Silfin and Kiri are already following them, so Umaru suggests walking home together. Now these four are officially a group. Bamba asks Taihi at his workplace if he could come to his house for dinner and Taihi. Of course agrees. He politely asks Alex to join as well, but before he can finish, Alex politely declines, leaving Taihi and Bamba in a confused state. The three arrive at Taishi's place, and he introduces Alex to Lil Kumaru. Umaru feels as if she has seen Alex somewhere before. Taihi makes a delicious hotspot, to which Bamba shares that autumn is the best season for vegetable dishes. Upon hearing that it's autumn, Umaru and Alex remember that tonight's the parade of autumn specials with all the special autumn anime episodes and songs. Seeing Alex's excitement, Umaru remembers that there's someone else who gets overhyped at everything. She finally realizes that Alex is the brother of Silfin. The more she stares at Alex, the more similarities she finds among them. Being two anime freaks, Alex and Umaru start to get along really well. Now Alex is Umaru's brother as well. Taihi and Bamba stare at these two anime freaks who just met each other and act like best friends already and realize that this is the true power of anime. Ever before heading back home, 
Alex asks Umaru if it will be all right be come by again with some of his favorite Blu-rays and Umaru replies that she's totally looking forward to it. Taiyi Hai thanks Umaru for making sure that Alex has a good time because he often seems distracted, even at the office since he joined as a special recruit. Bamba wonders why was he a special hire. On his way back, Alex informs someone on his phone that he has made contact with Umaru Doma. Turns out he was only fake playing a spy role with himself and there's no one on the phone. While Taihi is busy with his work, Umaru is having the best time of her life with her earpick. The next morning, Taihi steps on the earpick and breaks it by mistake. He decides to buy a new one on his way back home. Upon waking up, Umaru's ear is all itchy so she looks around to find the earpick but can't. She starts to experience the weird, creepy, crawly feelings as little Umaru demons in her ear plot against her to show her the worst time possible. They want to use this opportunity to show Umaru how much they despise the intrusion of those earpicks. Little demons put on their disco lights and begin their party. Meanwhile, Umaru rolls on the floor with an itchy feeling that she can do nothing about. She's telepathically begging her Oni-chan to come and save her. Bamba notices that Taihi is heading out earlier than usual. So Taihi reveals that it's not because a nerd like him is getting some action tonight. He simply has to buy earpicks on his way back. Bamba reveals that Omaru must be having a tough time right now since the itching is worst right after using the earpick. Taihi heals bad for Omaru, so he heads home right away along with Bamba. Omaru is relieved to see Taihi back and Bamba shows her the earpicks they bought. They bought one of each kind that was available at the store. So the little demons in her ear are about to face the consequences of their actions. First one is the screwdriver, which has high attack power in all directions. Second one is three wires that work thrice as efficiently as the normal one. Third one is the flashlight one that somehow brightens them to the point of extinction. For now, Umaru uses the normal one and after a few minutes, she lies in Taihi's lap so he does the hard work. Seeing Tais K use the earpick on Umaru, he gets a nostalgic feeling of when mothers cleaned their ears when they were just a kid. So Bamba requests Taihi to do him next. There's a new rumor going on at Umaru's school that Umaru's brother is a handsome actor and that her dad is German. Later at the arcade, Umaru wonders how these rumors keep popping up and evolve each time she hears them. Silthin approaches her and asks for advice, which is new to Umaru since Silthin never does something normal like this. She invites Umaru to her house, so Umaru agrees to go along with her to Silthin's traditional Japanese house. As they are walking to Silphin's room, Umaru could easily guess that they have entered Alex's territory with all the anime posters. Since it's a weekday, Alex is most probably at work. Silphin leads her to the basement with a huge library and reveals that she wants Umaru's help to study for the tests. Silphin reveals her intention to Umar of defeating Umaru from her class this time. While sitting in the library, Umaru remembers that Silphin told her in class that she always studies in their private library, and that Silphin's father is German and their mother is Japanese. Umaru realizes that the rumors are actually about Silphin, but with her name instead. Umaru bursts out in laughter and the study session continues. Taihi arrives back to a messy home with three lil hamsters sleeping on the floor. So he yells at Umaru and wakes her up. The next morning, Taihi dresses up as a mother and lectures Umaru about how important it is to stay and keep the surroundings clean. This is a detox session for both the apartment and Umaru's soul. Taihi explains that no matter how much he cleans, the apartment is always messy by the weekend, and that's because Umaru is too lazy to put the things back in their places. On the contrary, Umaru claims that if she didn't make a mess, Taihi wouldn't have anything to do on the weekends. Taihi teaches her the cleaning technique number one, that is, to decide what goes where. Umaru starts working on this technique and wonders how Taihi learned about it. Just then, she finds a detox book with lots of bookmarked pages. After putting everything in their places, there's still a bunch of leftover, so Taihi moves on to the second technique that is storing whatever remains left from step one. If there's no designated place, that means that the item isn't used much, so they start to box up the volumes of the same size and genre together. Umaru wonders what to do about the DVD cases with game CDs in them. After putting the box inside, there's still some stuff left, so Taihi introduces her to the last technique of throwing away the remaining stuff. He tries to convince the reluctant Amaru that all things must meet an end. Omaru begins mocking Taihi in his detox book, so he lets go of the throwing away plan. 
The next day, Umaru brings out her retro game, and while changing CDs, she decides to put the CD and case back in its place. Umaru keeps the room clean till the following weekend when Taihi E feels utterly useless with nothing to do, so he tells her that she can create a little mess if possible. The next Sunday, Umaru meets up with Ebenai, Sofin, and Kiri for their movie plan at the mall. Seeing that Silfin has already bought popcorn, they delay the lunch plan and decide to watch a movie first. They enjoy the Master Detective Nakon movie where Umaru is coming up with theories to see if she's right. Silfin was up late last night watching the previous seasons of Precuere, so she's sleeping. Abina is trying her best to enjoy, but her hunger is getting over her. Kiri is waiting for the movie to end, so the lights are turned back on. The movie day comes to an end. Kiri is enjoying a peaceful day with her master Kumaru while remembering when she was drawing Kumaru's picture earlier and her idiot brother barged into the room to disrupt her peace so she had to honor him with the broomstick. Just then, the doorbell rings and it's Alex at the door. Umaru inserts the game that, that Alex brought that is supposed to be from Alabama. Alex is excited to play this popular talk of the town game. Before that, he asks Kumaru sensei about this new face so Umaru introduces her friend Kiri to Alex. Alex politely introduces himself with a wink and Kiri already has a million questions about this sparkly boy's behavior, but her introverted nature restricts her from asking anything. The game begins, and they are already at the first choice. Alex chooses the right option and the favorability goes up. Alex and Umaru discuss how good the voice of the main girl is and Kiri couldn't barely understand the weeb talk let alone keep with it up. She doesn't want her master Kumaru to think that she isn't enjoying their company, so she smiles creepily and decides to take part in the next choice. Alex thinks that option C would be the best choice, but Kiri is picturing herself as the girl and Umaru as the lead hero, so she thinks that option A which is talking to the girl is a better approach. Alex thinks that the favorability would go down if option A is chosen, but Kiri thinks otherwise, so Alex saves the game to try out both options to see who is right. Alex is stunned by the results as Kiri was right. She knew how good it felt when Amaru talked to her in the hallway at school, so there was no way she could be wrong. Omaru is busy with her game, so Taihi asks if she bought a new game. Omaru reveals that it's the famous Chomp Chomp watching. Even Taihi saw commercials for this game. To keep up with the new trends, Omaru had an eye on this game for a while now. She is optimistic that she can finish this game by tomorrow. However, a week has passed since this statement and Omaru is still trying to find the super rare items. Taihi hopes that she will get tired of this game soon. However, he realizes that Umaru has gotten addicted to this game now. On his way to work, he realizes that it's not just Umaru but a number of people are totally into this game. Even Alex is having trouble finding the super rare items. On his way back, Taihi runs into Abina and asks for advice saying that his co-worker has gotten addicted to a new game. Abina reveals that she's not much of a gamer herself, but if she really gets into something, she would also find herself in a similar situation. Taihi realizes that he needs to change his approach, so the next day, he buys the Chomp Chomp game for himself and surprises Umaru. She is proud of her brother who is finally ready to hop on the big wave. They play together for an hour and have a good time. Just then, Taihi closes the game, saying that he doesn't want to finish a game as fun as this one at once. He likes to enjoy things a little at a time. Umaru gets the message and turns the game off. Taihi concludes that telling her to quit something she likes is cruel. It's better to teach her the way to truly enjoy something. A month later, Umaru and Taihi, I have finally collected all the rare items. Taihi is happy now that Umaru will be able to get over this game. Just then, the advertisement on TV announces that Chomp Chomp Watching 2 will be going on sale soon. Taihi realizes that there's no escape to this matrix. The weather is stormy and the school portrays a haunting sight where the MVP walks in the hallway to check his result. As usual, he secures the first spot, and the two guys who didn't notice the legendary Taihi Doma standing behind them get scared at his overwhelming presence behind them. They turn around and notice the horn on Taihi's head, realizing that he's undoubtedly Taihi the demon. With that, Bamba ends the story by explaining to Amaru how Taihi used to be in school. He admits that the story might be a bit exaggerated, but it's not a lie. 
Since Taihi always scored a perfect 100, everyone used to call him Taihi the Demon. Taihi gets up to prepare for dinner and Umaru wonders if he's mad. But Bamba reveals that Taihi never gets mad over something as small as this. Umaru shares that he does get super cranky if someone bugs him while he's cooking. Bamba asks Umaru if Ebina will visit again because he wants to see her again. Umaru is now confused and is so close to calling the cops on this corporate lowly con slave with weird hair. However, Bamba shares that Ebina is super super kind and he was hoping that a girl as nice as Ebina would easily be able to make friends with his sister. Bamba is worried that his sister, Kiri, may not have many friends and Ebina doesn't seem to care about stuff like this. Umaru praises Bam, saying that he's actually a good guy. Now Bamba has forgotten about Kiri and wants to hear more praises about him. Bamba and Umaru start playing with Metal Niankosu while Taihi A notices that the sky is turning dark so he runs to the balcony to save the clothes from getting drenched. He strictly informs Bamba and Umaru to stay out of the kitchen, but their curiosity leads them to the kitchen. Just as Umaru is about to touch the pot, Taihi barges in and stops them. Umaru and Bamba witness the famous Taihi the demon and Umaru gets scared, so she starts crying. Taihi I calms down and apologizes, saying that he's heating up oil and they might burn themselves, so he told them to stay out. The three of them enjoy a nice meal afterward. Kiri runs to Umaru's house, all excited because her master Kumaru herself invited her. However, her excitement drains as she sees Alex sitting with Umaru. Alex has already labeled Kiri as the cold and bristly girl. Alex brings out another Italian cat that he brought for Umaru, and now she has two metal nine kosu. Out of guilt for breaking it, she shows the one Alex gave to Taihi, but Alex gets excited over the beautiful customization. He gives a present to Kiri as well, and even though she doesn't want to accept it, she ends up receiving her first ever gift from outside the family. She opens the gift, and it's the damaged version of the Madame Black Death Devil. Even though Alex is presenting his all-time favorite figurine to honor Kiri for beating her at a game, but Kiri is not into such arrow ero stuff, so she doesn't know how to reject it. Turns out Umaru likes it. So she decides to give it to Umaru until she realizes how bold it is for her innocent and cute master. She takes the gift and heads back home. She is about to throw it away, but then she realizes that it's her first ever gift and she should keep it. Later that night, Umaru sees a hamburger commercial and now she's craving a hamburger. The next day at school, she keeps thinking about hamburgers. On their way back, Silfen invites everyone to her house and Abina asks Umaru what she thinks about the idea and Umaru ends up saying hamburger. Now, Ibina is also craving hamburgers and Silfen feels honored over the mention of food from her German culture, so she suggests checking out how hamburgers taste in Japan. They arrive at the end Donald's and Umaru finally fulfills her craving. For a second, she forgets that she's not at home and feels grateful for this high school girl experience. Meanwhile, Abina is fully immersed in her pile of hamburgers that she claims she can finish herself. Taihi asks Umaru what kind of Christmas cake she wants this time, and Umaru reveals that she will be spending this Christmas with her friends. Taihi remembers how she told him last time that she wanted a Santa cake and falls deep in loneliness, sadness, and despair. Umaru notices and tells her that he should make the cake nonetheless for them to cut the next day. Taihi informs Bamba about it, and he knows how lonely Taihi gets when there's nothing to do. And since they don't have to work over time, he suggests hanging out together. Alex shares that he's going to a Christmas concert of anime songs and asks them if they want to join him. Bamba is not so happy with the idea, but seeing how excited Umaru is to hang out with her friends, Taihi decides to enjoy it as well. So he agrees with the concert plan. The girls meet up at the mall, and Umaru asks Ebina why she didn't go home this Christmas. Ebina reveals that she has been enjoying a lot with them lately, so she wanted to spend Christmas with them. Silfen gets all excited upon hearing this, while Kiri is extremely happy to spend this day with Umaru, happy on the inside. They walk around to see the Christmas lights. Just then, Umaru sees a Santa outfit on sale, and remembers how Taihi dressed up as Santa last time and wonders what he might be doing. Meanwhile, Alex and Bamba, who easily get into everything, are having a great time at the concert. However, Taihi, the nerd, doesn't seem to be having a great time time. Finally, Silfen decides to bring the girly topic to the table to ask the girls if they have anyone special they want to spend Christmas Day with. All the girls reply that they do not, clearly understanding that Silfen is hinting towards relationships. However, Silfen is a fan of never letting them know your next move, 
so she suggests they all should go back to her place and party. Abina and Umaru are impressed with the decorated house, while Kiri is nervous about the new place. They all sit in the kotatsu and the girls notice an extra seat and ask if there's someone else joining them as well. Umaru wonders if it's Alex, but Silfen reveals, with her excitement emote, that she invited her friend Umar as well. Abina and Kiri have no idea who she is, while Umaru is wondering when she promised her and how to make up for not being able to join her since she has already joined her. Silfen reveals that she didn't have many friends since she came to Japan and she had no idea how to make friends, so she learned the Japanese custom of making friends by challenging others and beating them. That is why she went around and kept challenging Umaru. She reveals that it was ultimately Umar who taught her that to make friends, she just has to have fun with them. She gives the credit for the friendship of these four to Umar. She looks back at their time together. The girls enjoy the dinner and Silfen ends up dozing off in the kotatsu, so the three leave her a note from each and head back to their houses. Just then, Umaru receives a text from Silfen, inviting her to the party at her house. Umaru realizes that the message must have been delayed due to Christmas, so she tells Ibina that she forgot something at Silfen's house and heads back. She puts on her Umar mask and runs back. Meanwhile, Ebina runs into Taihi, so the three of them, Ebina, Taihi, and the chimney walk back together. A kid calls them a couple, and now they are both red. Ebina remembers Silfen's words to ask for advice otherwise she will regret it and decides to ask a favor from Taihi. Meanwhile, Silfen dreams about her childhood days when she used to be mini Silf and asked Santa for some Japanese friends as a Christmas present. She informs Alex that Santa seemed disturbed upon hearing her wish, so Alex tells her that even Santa cannot make friends with someone else. Instead, he tells her to ask for a computer once she's in middle school so she can talk to people from Japan through the internet. He shows mini Silf, his Japanese friend, Shinra Rasa sound Ken serious. He reveals to Silfen that he will soon be able to meet Shinra because he's going to Japan for high school. Silfen felt very lonely once Alex left, but just then, she saw a post from Alex's friend playing Stream Fighter. The commentator in the video stated that challenging others and beating them is the best way to become friends. So Silfen asked for a controller from Santa. Silfen wakes up and finds the notes from her friends. Just then, she hears someone call her name so she opens the door and it's Umar in a Santa suit. Emma reveals that she saw these Santa suits on sale and asks if she looks good. Silfen gets overjoyed since she asked a Japanese friend from Santa and now she has a Japanese friend dressed as Santa. Dama siblings wake up on New Year's and Taihi, still half sleeping, hands Umaru's New Year's allowance to her. Umaru gets excited as there's nothing Nothing better to see first thing in the morning than money. She notices that Taihi Ai is still half asleep though. At breakfast, Taihi hands Umaru her allowance again and now she's confused. She wonders if she's being tested. She ends up accepting both envelopes and within a couple of seconds, she lets go of the guilt and realizes that it's great. She refers to this event as a vending machine's mistake when it hands two callas instead of one. Since it's Tai's mistake, she shouldn't feel any guilt. She uses Raman's example next, saying that she must return however. Umaru then puts forth the arcade example. The Umaris end up fighting until Detective Umaru, the Dumaru, appears and asks why Taihi prepared two envelopes in the first place. Dumaru concludes that Taihi intended to give Umaru two allowances this year. Just then, Abina rings the doorbell and wishes them a happy new year. She's still embarrassed about whatever they talked about on Christmas Eve. Taihi tells Abina that he has a present for her and when he gets inside to check his desk, he notices that the envelope for Abina is not there. Taihi ends up handing her the cash without an envelope and gets back inside to question the culprit. Umaru tries to use the vending machine logic but ends up returning the envelope. Bamba wakes up and notices that Taihi is not at his desk. So Alex shares that he was called to the meeting room. Meanwhile, Umaru complains to Ibina about how Taihi gets mad at her whenever she creates a little mess. Unfortunately, Ebene doesn't know what little mess is in Umaru's dictionary. Ibina still vouches for Taihi, saying that he's really kind and a great listener. While thinking about Ibina's words, Umaru realizes that she's right and Taisei is actually super nice, and she's the one who is at fault. Umaru realizes that she needs to do something for him. Taihi arrives back home, and Umaru greets her in her actual form. She drags him inside and welcomes her to the Umaru-style space of happiness. Taihi sits down and gives her the breaking news that he has to go on a business trip as he got chosen as a member of the project team. Umaru gets all sad that her paradise with her brother is coming to an end. She begins crying and hugs Taihi, saying that he can't leave her. Taihi's eyes fill with tears as well, 
saying that he can't do anything about this decision. While crying a river, Umaru asks how long will he be gone. She doesn't want to stay away from Taiyi for a whole year. Taiyi reveals that he has to go for two whole weeks, and he's really worried that Umaru will create a huge mess in these two weeks. Now, Umaru is angry at hearing what he's actually worried about and wants him to be gone for good. Some diamond service company, where Taiyi is supposed to be working, is sponsoring this anime, which is not true because Umaru is just imagining to be in a commercial. Taihi is all packed up for the two-week-away trip and Umaru is wondering why he only has this small bag. Guess what, Umaru, because he's a guy. Taihi is still worried for Umaru, but she tells him to relax because Kiri will keep her company. She asks if she could order a pizza for herself, and Taihi knows that despite cooking different meals for all days, Umaru might get bored of the homemade dinner. So he brings out a 10,000 yen note and hands it to Umaru. Now she can't wait to buy lots of snacks. Bamba enters the room and states that he can burn through this much money in a single day. So Taihi I doubles the amount while Umaru praises Lord Bamba. He suggests eating eel since Taihi's project is to come up with a restaurant's management system and they are going to Hamamatsu to gather more information. Now Umaru also wants to eat eel so she starts throwing a tantrum. Bamba suggests bringing Umaru with them but of course that's not possible. Kano greets Taihi, Alex, and Bamba at the station and Bamba wonders why Kano Kano is here, but Taihi informs him that Kano is the one who planned this trip. Kano can't wait to have a trip with her crush, Taihi. Taihi he thinks about Umaru and what his messy lil sister must be doing right now. Just then, the girl in the front seat asks Taihi how long till they get to Hamamatsu. The girl turns out to be Umaru and Taihi. I can't even act surprised to make sure no one else finds out that his spoiled sister is following him. Umaru refuses to go back until she has tasted eel. Meanwhile, Kano is looking for forward to getting some time alone with Taihi for something to happen. Taihi Sai imagines a scenario where he introduces everyone to Amaru, but realizes that it would sound really dumb and unprofessional. Just then, Kano checks the schedule and informs them that she mixed 8 am with 8 pm and they are only 12 hours earlier. Taihi suggests splitting and checking out different places for future references, and while he only wants to send Umaru back after treating her with eel, Kano is daydreaming about how Taihi wants to check a few venues for their marriage. Since it's still early for lunch, Taihi decides to do some sightseeing with Umaru, who already wants to do an anime pilgrimage. An anime pilgrimage is visiting real life locations that have appeared in their favorite manga or anime. Don't visit Shibuya though because that will only haunt you. They touch the arch of lucky stars and Taihi realizes that it feels illegal for siblings to do it together when usually it's the couple's activity, so he lets go. Speaking of couples, Umaru asks about Kano and why he calls his boss by her first name, which is only done by very close people in Japan. Taihi reveals that they have been best friends since high school, and the reason she's Taihi's boss despite being a year younger than him is because Kano is the daughter of the CEO. He knows that she has a lot of burden to be the section leader, but she's doing her best. Umaru asks if they are lovers and Taihie denies it. After some sightseeing, they head to a restaurant to enjoy the eel. They are amazed by the sight of the eel, and after enjoying its aroma for a few seconds, they dig in. Umaru and Taihi I enjoy the lunch and then Taihi sees Umaru off. Taihi and the team arrive at the restaurant where they are dressed up as chef. The strict head chef treats them as proper trainees and puts them to work. Whereas Kano enjoys the sight of Taihi in a chef hat, Umaru thinks about Taihi and Kana on her way back. Let's get back to Christmas Eve to find out what Abina told Taihi. Abina told Taihi that she was looking for a particular restaurant. Back to the present, Taihi and Ko have been at this restaurant for a week now, and Taihi finds it easier to work on his report since they are working inside the kitchen. Head chef praises Taihi's cooking because the way he's so careful and delicate shows that he cooks for someone else. They even offer Taihi to work alongside them, given how polished his cooking skills are. But Taihihi I thinks about Umaru and declines. Taihirai praises the chef, saying that he's learning a lot from him. Turns out Mr. Chef cannot handle the compliments, so now smoke is coming out of his ears. Wait, that means two chimneys. The chef finally reveals his name, Koichiro Ibina. Taihi remembers from Christmas Eve when Eb and I told him that her brother works at some restaurant in Tokyo, and he left home 10 years ago, so she doesn't really know where he is. 
Taihi has realized that Koichiro is Abina's brother. The business trip comes to an end, and he is happy with everything that happened during these two weeks. Kanao, on the other hand, is not happy because nothing happened in these two weeks. Taihi arrives back home and witnesses the horrifying sight of the messy apartment. He decides to teach Umaru the basic rule of get rumbled, stay humbled. After cleaning up the apartment, Umaru and Taihi head out to hand over the souvenirs. They give Abina her souvenirs, and since they don't know Kiri's address, they decide to give her whenever she arrives at their apartment. Meanwhile, Bamba tries to give a souvenir to Kiri, but ends up becoming a victim. Taihi and Umaru arrive at Silfin's house and hand her the souvenir. Silfin feels as if she just saw something like this a couple of minutes ago. That's because Alex also brought them. After shopping for groceries, Umaru and Taihi head back home, and Umaru gets back to her gaming business until she finally breaks and starts crying. She tells Taihi that she misses him a lot. Lil Handron Kamaru comes out of a camping tent and enjoys the fishing experience in one style. Later at school, the teacher informs everyone that Kiri Motoba has just placed third in the prefectural tournament. Everyone is impressed and after class, girls gather around Kiri to praise her. Just then, Kiri feels that her bag is in danger, so she masterfully protects her bag and smoothly sneaks out of the class. Later that day, she shows her master the certificate, and both Kumaru and the hamsters are impressed. Kiri gives the credit for this achievement to their Wii Wii sports game that they played together. Umaru shares that Kiri might actually become a pro swimmer. However, Kiri acts unhappy at this thought. Umaru feels that she said something wrong, but as Kiri tries to explain, the bag falls and hand-drawn Kumaru comes out of it. Kiri admits that she wants to be a storybook author. After a brief pause, Umaru appreciates her choice and asks to look into her book. Kiri hesitates at first, but ends up allowing her master to see her humble art. Silfen arrives at school in her kimono, and the girls wonder why she isn't in her uniform. Silfen reveals that it's because today is March 5th, the girls' day on which they dress in traditional Japanese clothing. To her surprise, Kiri corrects her that it's March 3rd and not 5th. Silfen gets embarrassed, but Umaru and Abina tell her that it's all right. They talk about the time they wore kimono and Kiri shares that she has a picture from back then. Silfen gets really sad over being left out, so the girls decide to take a picture of all four of them in kimono. Silfen takes them to her house so they can meet her mom. This young lady here is Silfen's smash. She analyzes Umaru and is deeply impressed by her proportionate beauty and asks for tips and tricks. Umaru looks back at her daily routine and decides that it's better to not give any specific answer. Mama Tachibana leads the girls into the kimono fitting room, where Silfen reveals that Mama Tachibana has won the All Japan Kimono Fitting Championship. The girls realize that Auntie Tachibana also has the same gotta be the best syndrome. Ebina is happy to see how close Silfen and her mom are. Just then, Mama Tachibana ambushes her and dresses her up as a cute little doll. Within a few minutes, the girls are all dressed up, so it's time for the photo shoot. Mrs. Tachibana has done some extra and prepared Chirashizushi for the occasion. She brings out the camera and takes the picture. The girls then dig into the lunch and praise Silfen's mother. Umaru shares that Mama Tachibana looks really young and Silfen replies that it's not true. Mama puts some sense into Silfen, so she always remembers no matter how many years pass by. Mama Tachibana will always be young. Kiri thinks about her master and draws her in her storybook. The next day, she shows Kumaru her storybook and Umaru praises her, saying that it's just like the big sellers. Umaru is deeply invested in her art, but Kiri thinks that she failed to capture the real grace, elegance, and beauty of her master Kumaru. Therefore, she asks Umaru to model for her. Umaru agrees and sits in a frozen pose with her potato chips. Umaru realizes that she's not cut out to be a model, so Kiri asks her to act normal and she will take care of the posing. Umaru can't do that with Kiri here, but Kiri reveals that hiding all traces of her presence is her special skill. Kiri activates her skill and disappears into the background. Umaru acts naturally for the rest of the day and falls asleep. Kiri feels that she's still not getting things right, so she decides to observe Umaru more closely. However, as she carefully observes Kumaru's face, she sees a total resemblance to Amaru, who is the same person, but Kiri still doesn't know that. Only Taihi is aware of this groundbreaking secret. Taihi arrives back, and Kiri immediately hides her art. Taihi hands Umaru the new flavor of chips he brought, and Kairi notices that Umaru's smile is the brightest when she's around Taihi. 
Kiri immediately heads back home to draw this smile of Umaru. On Sunday, Taihi sees the brochure of a new Western-style restaurant, so he wakes Umaru up and asks if they should eat there after shopping for groceries. However, Umaru declines, saying that she wants to sleep, so Taihi heads out for grocery shopping alone. At the supermarket, Taihi runs into Abina and praises her for being responsible enough to shop for herself. Abina reveals that she actually wanted to look at this new restaurant, so Taihi realizes that living in the same building does bring some similarities into their lives. She wonders if her brother might be working at this restaurant. Just as Taihi is about to tell her about her brother, they notice Kiri at the stationery shop. Kiri activates her skill to blend into the surroundings, but Abina stops her before the skill is fully activated. Taihi AC asks what she's doing with those markers, and Kiri is still not ready to share that she wants to be a storybook author. Abina realizes that Kiri doesn't want to share, so she answers on her behalf, saying that they use them in their art class. With the brochure in her hand, Umaru walks into the mall with disappointment as she never expected Taihi to go alone. She notices Taihi with Abina and Kiri and walks over to them. Abina again realizes that Kiri can't share whatever her secret is, so she answers about the pens. Taihi realizes Abina realizes that Kiri doesn't want to share, so he praises Abina for realizing what he also realized a bit late by saying that she's really kind. The compliment out of nowhere summons the chimney. All four of them try out the new restaurant, and whenever Taihi would look at Ebina, she would turn red and summon the chimney. Kiri notices that something is cooking. Omaru is having trouble sleeping due to the heat and the next morning. The Doma siblings wake up before the alarm, thanks to the heat of the sun. Umaru throws a tantrum, saying that she wants to turn the AC on, but Taihi, I thinks that May is too soon for AC. Umaru insists and uses the picture of Taihi also having trouble with sleep. Taihi is not against it because of the money, but because Umaru might get a cooling disorder, so turning on the AC before July is not an option. Umaru tries to butter him up, but fails. Later that night, Umaru is sweating all over again, but she doesn't have to worry because Taihi has brought out the fan Bomba gave him last year, and he completely forgot about it. Taihi puts the fan by the window, and Umaru is all happy again. She notices Taihi lying in a weird style, so she asks what he's up to. Taihi tells her to see for herself. Doma siblings stare at the starry sky under the fan, and Taihi begins telling her about the stars and feels as if he taught her all this before, too. But Umaru shares that it's the first time she's hearing all this. Omaru falls asleep, so Taihi puts the loaf on the bed. The next morning, Doma siblings again woke up before the alarm, but this time it was mosquitoes. The Kiri checks the horoscope and it's her lucky day for being a Pisces. Her lucky item is a Barrett and her lucky place is the amusement park. If a Pisces wants to get close to their special someone, today's the day. Kiri is all hyped up about spending some quality time with her princess Umaru. Silfen brings her back to reality as Kiri is not at the park, but at the mall with Abina and Silfin. Umaru arrives as well, so now everyone can go to the amusement park. Kiri gets happy at seeing Umaru and tries to approach her, but her luck runs out before the day begins as she trips on her shoelace. They get a bus to the park, and since it's Silfin's first time on a bus, she wants to make it count, so she extends her hand towards the push to stop button, but Abina stops her. The girls check out the pamphlet on Fujiyama lands, and Silfin shares that she wants to ride the roller coaster. Abina wants something more subtle like the merry-go-round. Umaru wants to ride the spinning teacups for her hardcore piloting experience. Kiri wants to do whatever Omaru wants to do. These arrive at the park and take pictures for their free pass. Kiri is worried as she notices in the pictures that her ghosts are also with her. Kiri heads to the bathroom while the girls stand outside the anime concert hall. She checks the horoscope again and gets a life lesson to never believe in them again. She runs back to Omaru, worrying that she might never invite her again. However, her laces are still untied and she trips again. Luckily this time, someone catches her Kiri starts to believe in the horoscope again now that Princess Umaru has saved her. Unfortunately, it wasn't Umaru but Alex who was here for the concert. Alex greets everyone and gives them the merchandise he got at the concert and leaves. The girls enjoy the roller coaster first, so Silfin now wants to try the god of coaster. They wait in the long line for an hour and the guard comes up to them, sharing that no one under 140 centimeters is allowed. The girls leave and Kiri has now given up on the horoscope and is firm on staying quiet so she doesn't cause any inconvenience to others. Just then, her hairband breaks and Kari starts panicking. 
a lot, so Umaru grabs her to the Ferris wheel and ties her hair to Alex's present. Kiri is finally alone with her special one, so she wonders what she should say. She breaks the silence and asks Umaru if it's boring to hang out with her since she ruined everyone's god of coaster plan and then worried everyone by crying out loud. Kiri doesn't want to say these things but her tongue has lost control as she shares that she didn't even get a decent picture on her entry pass and thinks that she is cursed. She tries to shush herself, but realizes that it's already too late and Umaru might never hang out with her. Umaru tells her that it's not true and that she's having a lot of fun. Umaru sits beside Kiri and shares that they still haven't gone to the spinning cups yet. The girls enjoy the spinning cup together. However, it proves to be different than what Kiri imagined due to some fluffy cushions hitting her again and again. Umaru tells Taihii that she's getting an award in front of the whole school and she's not really excited about it. Taihii feels bad for everyone who looks up to her and shares that she should think about everyone rooting for her. At school, Kiri congratulates Umaru to be getting an award, followed by Silfin and Umaru wonders if she has forgotten that she considers her a rival. Kiri reminds Silfin that she always thought of Umaru as her rival, but Silfin reveals that she did so before they started hanging out together, and now she feels as happy as if it was herself receiving the award. She thinks that it's strange, but Umaru realizes that Silfin Tachibana is a real one. Later that day, Umaru receives the award for academic excellence in general coursework and feels proud as all her friends are happy for her. Next up, the school presents an award for academic excellence in app courses to Hikari. After school, the girls walk back and Ibina shares that this was the first time she saw someone from ape classes as they have separate buildings. Umaru remembers that due to her excellent grades, she was offered to be moved to app courses but she declined. She still feels that she has seen Hikari somewhere before. Later that night, Hikari stares at the stars while remembering how Taihei used to teach her about them. Kumaru and Alex are emotional about finally ending the game Heartbeat Precura. While Kiri feels indifferent, Alex turns towards the cold and bristly girl and asks for her views, and Kiri honestly replies that she doesn't care. For some reason, she can't trust Alex because he also calls Kumaru his master, and Kiri wants to be Master Kumaru's one and only disciple, so she must protect her. Omaru asks Alex if he visits his friends back in Germany, but Alex replies that he used to be much different back in those days. One day, he stayed home from school, watching anime and playing games, and convinced himself that he didn't need to interact with others. Just then, his savior entered the room and brought him to Japan where his look took a great turn. Since then, he has realized that life is about people helping other people, and he loves it now. It's like his own version of Big Bang, which is the game they just played. The girls give a silent response because his speech made them realize that life is actually good for them too. Umaru suggests playing another game and Kiri joins in this time to make sure she remains her master Kumaru's top disciple. Later that night, Alex leaves Umaru's place and receives a call so he immediately rushes to his savior. He enters Kana's apartment, all hyped up, telling her that they need to celebrate Hikari's award. Hikari doesn't care much, but Alex is way too excited, and Kana looks at him, thinking how this guy hasn't changed at all since middle school. After all, she brought him to Japan. Alex informs Kano that he and Umaru watched anime again today, and Taihi wasn't there. Kana blushes at hearing Taihi's name, telling him to spare her from the details. Ebina walks back to her apartment on a hot afternoon that takes her 10 years back to the best of when she was drawing on the ground while thinking about her favorite food. Lil Bina passes out and wakes up in her house with a fuzzy head, wondering if she's going to die, but her kind brother brings her some chilled rice soup. Lil Bina asks him if she's going to die, but he tells her that it's only a heat stroke. That's the last memory Abina has of her brother, as by the time she got well, her brother had already left. Remembering how high he spoke of Tokyo, Ebina is sure that that's where he must have gone. Ebina remembers the time she first arrived at her apartment and met Taihi. She got nervous around him because, for some reason, Taihi reminded her of her brother. She has spoken to Taihi a lot more times since then and has started thinking of him as her own brother. Just then, Taihi -e runs into her and tells her not to stand in the heat or else she'll get a heat stroke. Ebina runs back home and lies down, thinking about how her head feels fuzzy. Just like the last time, however, it's not scary anymore. To her, it's a happy kind of fuzzy now. Kiri walks back to home thinking about how her cute master Kumaru is an angel from God. However, her good mood is spoiled by the sight of her brother in boxers. 
character. Bamba informs her that their parents will be visiting their mom's family this weekend, so it will be only two of them from tomorrow onwards. Kiri is devastated at this gut-wrenching news. Kiri consults her master about this bad news the next day, saying that she doesn't want to be trapped in that hell. Umaru offers her to stay with her tonight as long as Taihiei permits them. Taihiei agrees and decides to head over to Bamba's place as he will be lonely. The girls didn't know that Taihiei knew Bamba is Kiri's brother, but he shares that Bamba told her when they were at the aquarium about Kiri, so Taihiei connected the dots. Taihiei leaves and Kiri asks her to tell Bamba that she's staying here or else he might get worried. Taihiei leaves and Kiri tells Umaru that her brother is really kind. He reminds her of a bana because she's also very kind. The girls play games together, enjoy a bath, wear hamster hoodies, and do some yoga. Meanwhile, the guys sit back with their beer and Taihi reveals to Bamba that the girl in the hat with them at the aquarium was Kiri. The girls lie in bed and Umaru asks Kiri what her house is like. This gets Kiri to think about her home and her childhood days when she would run back home and Bamba would wait for her outside, worrying that she might have gotten lost. Lil Kiri remembers how she used to ask Bamba to give her a piggyback ride. Kiri is brought back to the present by her master calling her name in her sleep. Umaru dreams about Kiri riding a fish and Kiri is glad that her master has formed a bond with her storybook. The next morning, Kiri heads back to her place. Meanwhile, the guys are drunk but still drinking beer while Bamba shares how things have gone downhill between him and Kiri. Taihi feels like throwing up, so he heads to the bathroom and drunk Bamba thinks that Taihi has abandoned him, so he yells his name and the house becomes Hades. Omaru is enjoying her manga indoors with explasting on a hot day. She notices that Kiri is deeply invested in something so she checks what she's reading and turns out that the girl finally confesses her love to the boy, but the train came in between before they parted ways and now the girl, Kiri and Umaru, have no idea if he heard the confession. They have to wait a week to find out and they are freaking out. Omaru shares how it's always fun to root for the people in love. Upon hearing this, the picture of Taihi and Abina enters Kiri's mind and how she didn't exactly want to root for them. She feels that she has submitted to her dark side, and by remembering how she hates this lovey-dovey stuff, she feels embarrassed. With tears in her eyes, she confesses to her master that she can't root for love. Omaru wonders if Kiri is getting this worked up, because she wants to be a storybook author, and being her master, Umaru realizes that she must give a definitive answer. She tells her not to be bothered by these negative thoughts and to believe in what she wants to believe in. Kiri likes the advice and decides to apply it in her life. On her way back, she runs into Ebene and straightforwardly asks her if she likes Taiyi Doma. Abina turns all red with embarrassment, and before she says anything, Kiri tells her with a straight face that she will be rooting for them. Ebena could say nothing but okay. Kiri promises to be the best wingman. Taihi looks at her sister sleeping on her plushie in the middle of the mess she created and how everyone thinks of her as a perfectionist and how reality is much more different. He wakes her up and tells her that summer vacation is not for lazing around, instead experiencing things she can't do during school. Umaru claims that she has changed and shows proof that instead of reading Jumpu, she's reading Jumpu Square. Taihi realizes that the situation is worse than he imagined, so to take her out of the house, he suggests going to the summer fireworks scheduled for today. Umaru denies it, but Taihi hits the weak spot by talking about lots of food stalls. Omaru can't wait anymore. She dresses up and asks if she could invite others. She starts by ringing Abina's doorbell. Meanwhile, Kiri and Abina are having an official meeting where Kiri is telling Abina to invite Taihi to the fireworks to set the right mood. Ebina's thoughts are going crazy, so she summons the chimney. Just then, Umaru rings the doorbell and is glad to see Kiri here as well. They head to Silfin's place next who's obviously excited to join them. Before that, she invites everyone in so they could dress up for the festival. Everyone is ready and the girls finally notice a flaw in Taihi. He didn't compliment them in their kimonos. Little do they know, Taihi doesn't want to go behind bars. The girls enjoy their favorite stalls and before the fireworks, Taihi lays out the cloth for them to sit. The fireworks begin and Taihi notices that while everyone is focused on the fireworks, Umaru is using the opportunity to shrink down. He realizes that he can't change her right away. Taihi wakes Umaru up to remind her that summer vacations are over and she needs to go to school. Taihi has the day off, so Umaru asks him to bring potato chips while he's shopping for groceries. During lunch, Ebina tells Umaru that the teacher was looking for her to hand her the certificate from the ceremony that has been on display. She shares that the last time two people won this award was 10 years ago, 
and Omaru shares that it must have been Taihi since he always got the perfect scores according to Bamba. Ebina and Kiri are happy to know and Silfin also shares that she likes Umaru's brother. Ebina and Kiri misunderstand her and get shocked as they sense rivalry. Meanwhile, Taihi the demon notices that the bread is on sale so he should make cream stew today. Silfin elaborates that he's really kind and caring and makes the other person feel at ease. Kiri thinks about it and totally agrees. However, Abina notices that Kiri is also thinking about Taihi, so she feels betrayed and her eyes lose all the willingness to live. Kiri clarifies that she's only thinking about Taihi as her brother. Umaru receives the certificate, and even the teachers speak highly of Taihi. Umaru thinks about how everyone likes her brother and feels proud. She runs back home and sees Taihi walking back from the grocery store, so she decides to scare him from behind. However, she is surprised by an unexpected person coming out of nowhere and hugging Taihi. Taihi doesn't seem to remember her, but Umaru shares that it's Hikari Kongo from her school. Taihi invites her in, and Umaru tries to talk to her but Kongo tells her to lounge around as usual and not get bothered by her. Umaru gets scared that Kongo knows about her, but turns out she only heard it from Alex. Kongo claims that Taihei is her big brother. Taihei brings some bread, and while Umaru is still confused, Kongo can't resist and eats all the bread. Umaru shrinks down and complains to Taihei. Taihei finally remembers that it's Hikari, Kanao's sister. He reminds Umaru of Kanao from Hamamatsu, saying that it's her younger sister. Hikari gets emotional and calls Taihei one Oni chan Umaru gets jealous and tells her that he's her one chan Hikari then gets up to leave, telling him that she will come again and Taihei tells her to come by whenever she wants to. While heading out, Hikari gives a rival stare to Amaru. She's happy that Taihi still remembers her. Meanwhile, Umaru questions Taihi about why she called him big brother and why she showed up today. She lets her jealousy take over and shares that Hikari seems very fishy to her. Omaru is recording a video of her squeakily cute hamsters when Taihi walks in and asks what she's doing. As she tells him, she notices a bag in her hand and asks what's inside. Taihi pulls out the camera bomba, lets him have because he bought a new one and doesn't need it anymore. Bamba is team canon now, so he doesn't want this one anymore. Umaru shares that Bamba doesn't look like someone who likes to take pictures and Taihi shares that Bamba keeps shifting from hobby to hobby as he gets bored easily. Taihi asks Umaru to act natural so he can take a picture of her but Umaru immediately tidies up, closes the curtain, gets back to her normal size, and strikes a pose. Taihi has no clue what part of it was supposed to be natural. Umaru asks Taihi to smile so she can take a picture of him and before he can perfect the smile, Umaru clicks the picture of his weird face. She notices that Bamba forgot his memory card inside and scrolls through the pictures. Taihi grabs the camera, telling her that it's impolite to look at other people's pictures without their permission. Finding old pictures is fun, so Omaru brings out her own card to take lots of pictures. She asks Taihi to take a picture of her with her lil hamsters so she can participate in some competition. Taihi I remembers that the reason Bamba gave him his camera is because Umaru will be all grown up before he knows it so he should take some pictures, at least for the future, and he will thank himself for it. They head out to take some more pictures. The next day, Taisa returns Bamba his memory card, so Bamba checks what pictures are on it. Unfortunately, Taihi's weird face picture is still on it, and Bamba is going to preserve it forever now. Bamba couldn't take Kiri's pictures with his new camera, though. Amir and Silfin find out that their usual arcade is closed, so Silfin suggests another place. She takes her to a retro department store that gives a really nostalgic vibe. They head to the rooftop arcade and have a lot of fun. They started going there more and Omaru suggests Taihi to go there with her. Taihi he tells her that it's an old building with few customers, so it might be closed down soon. Omaru notices the next day that there actually aren't many customers, but there's no closing down sign, so she stays in the delusion that the department store will always stay here. Some days later, the department store was crushed down. A few months later, the girls pass by that place, and Abina wonders if there used to be a building here. Silfin shares that there used to be an amazing amusement park here. Omaru realizes that Silfin might have known that the store was closing, so she created some last memories of that place. Omaru realizes that even if the scenery changes, the memories never change. Abina receives rice in her mail again, so she brings a bag for Taihi and Umaru. Again, Taihi asks her to join them, and Abina suggests cooking takikomi rice. 
Abina helps him out in the kitchen and feels really nervous along with her chimney at being with Tai He in the kitchen alone. This is exactly according to Kiri's scheme of using a man's stomach to land him for sure. Umaru enters the kitchen and offers to help as well. That's because she can't let Ibina find out that Tai He is the one who always makes the food. Umaru is trying to help out, but she's only increasing the work while Abina is blushing and telepathically apologizing to Kiri, saying that she can't land him. The Umaru starts a fire in the kitchen that scares everyone and Tai He takes a step back, bumping into Abina, who loses balance and is about to fall when Tai He catches her. She has now received a lot of damage and Abina has been out of her senses for some time now. Omaru feels bad for scaring Abina and confesses that she can't cook at all. Fortunately, Abina is out of order for now and all she could focus on is that Taihi grabbed her. The three of them enjoy a nice lunch. Omaru is playing her game when Taihi comes home with an unexpected guest. He ran into Heikari and brought her along, but Omaru suspects that it was Heikari's plan and not a coincidence. Heikari's smirk confirms it, but it doesn't matter to Taihei. Taihi starts cooking for dinner and hears the voices of Hikari and Umaru, realizing that they aren't getting along. He comes up with a clever plan to make pancakes together, so the tension disappears between the girls. Omaruru takes the first turn and makes an undercooked pancake. Hikari claims to do better and ends up making an overcooked pancake. Taihi goes next and teaches them to make the perfect pancakes. The girls wonder what kind of sorcery this is. Taihi eats the ones made by his sisters and Hikari admits that she wanted to eat bread with him and that her showing up wasn't a coincidence. Umaru gives Hikari the award she forgot here last time, and Taihi praises her which makes Umaru jealous and the girls start fighting over which award is better when they are both the winners of the same award. Umaru brings out her hamsters and metal niankas to play with them, but Taihi teaches her that small animals have been known to die from stress, so they should shouldn't be treated as toys. The next day, Kiri wonders why Kumaru isn't bringing hamsters out, so she tells Kiri that apparently, she has been tiring them out. Kiri shares that fish also feel stressed by different people coming by every day. Omaru thinks that it's not an issue for hamsters as they stay inside the house. The next day, Abina visits, and then Bama and Alex, and then Kumaru dresses up as Umar. Taihi feeds the hamsters and apologizes on Umaru's behalf saying that she is a bit hard to get along with. Hamsters turn their back to Taihi. The next day, Umaru comes back, enjoys her games and snacks, and then brings out the hamsters to ask them what they should do next. With nothing to do, the hamsters notice that Umaru gets lonely without Taihi, so they drag their hamster ball to suggest playing with it. Taihi arrives back and rescues the poor Lil hamsters, paying the price of their kindness. Emir is at the arcade, fully focused on winning the game while the crowd is gathered around her and Silfin to witness the historical moment. Uncle and bro are nervous that Umar might bankrupt them. Luck favors them and Umar misses the target. But that's exactly what she planned because it's her secret technique, the Sweets Canyon. By sliding a single box, she crumbles the whole mountain. Everyone, including Silfin, are impressed. The girls head out and Silfin asks Umar if she would like to come to her house and Umar agrees. Umar looks around Silfin's comfy room with lots of trophies and she even puts up the pictures from when the girls went to the amusement park. Silfin brings out Sprite and shares that she likes to watch anime while enjoying snacks and drinking Sprite. Umar is happy to know that Silfin is exactly like her and the only difference is the choice of drink. She asks Silfin to show how it's done and the girls start digging through snacks. Silfin shares that she heard that friends in Japan play the pokey game, and Umaru is stunned when Silfin asks to play this game with her. Umaru declines, and when Silfin insists, Umaru tells her that the pokey game should only be played with someone who's really special to her. Silfin claims that Umar is her most special friend of her, but Umaru ends up raising her voice and scolding her for this childish request. Both apologize to each other and bing an anime. The anime shows the pokey game scene and Silfin finally realizes what the pokey game actually is, so now she's super embarrassed. Hikari arrives at Taihi's place and the three of them enjoy dinner together. Taihi asks Hikari if Kana knows that she has been hanging around here, and Hikari's response confirms that Kana doesn't know. Omaru uses the opportunity to mess with Hikari by telling Taihi to call Kana, otherwise, she might get worried about her. 
Taihei agrees that Kanao must be cooking for her right now, but Hikari breaks into tears, claiming that Kanao works overtime on Tuesdays, so she has to eat on her own. Omaru can relate to how lonely it is when she has to eat alone, so she makes up with Hikari and even allows her to come by again. Although she doesn't want Hikari to come by every week, but Hikari claims that she will come by every week. Hikari arrives back home, all happy to have spent time with her favorite brother. Kanao comes back while she's hugging the globe, so she hugs Kanao. Kanao then scolds Hikari saying that she knows Hikari has been going out on Tuesdays without telling her. She tells her that it's dangerous to go out alone this late. Taihi is glad that Omaru acted like a bigger person to allow Hikari to come again. Silfin and Umar are walking by a street when Silfin looks at a closed shop and shares that there used to be a beauty shop here. Umaru wonders why Silfin is into retro stuff and she shares that it's because she feels nostalgic while looking at them. Silfin reveals that she has been to Japan once before when she was six. At that time, she saw an old arcade with a beautiful lake and a giant swan. She still cherishes this memory. Amir shares that she knows where that place is, so the girls take the train. Silfin is worried that the scenery might have changed by now and her memory might get tainted. However, she's extremely delighted to see that Sagamiko Park hasn't changed. Even some of the store employees are the same from 10 years ago. Silfin remembers how she was crying about not going back to Germany as she wanted to stay with her brother. The girls hop on the boat together and Silfin thanks Umur for bringing her here as she cherishes the memory of of when she rode this boat with Alex. Midterm tests are scheduled for tomorrow, and Abina is really worried that she might fail and not make it to the next grade. The girls are surprised that Abina waited till the last day before the exam to reveal this information. Silfin takes them all to her royal library so they can conduct a study group session. Umaru acts surprised because she can't reveal that she has been here before, dressed as Umar. Kiri asks Ebina about her weakest subject and Abina proudly shares that all of her subjects are her weak subjects. They conduct a mock test and Abina does well in it. So Umaru shares that Abina might have performance anxiety because she always does well when they are studying together but messes up during the test. Abina shares that the serious atmosphere during the exam makes her feel that she's the one falling behind. She feels that a lot could go wrong, so she should just get up and go back to Akita. There to help Ebony deal with her anxiety, Kiri shares that she personally thinks of other people as vegetables to purge them from her mind. If Abina were to picture everyone as something she likes, which is food, she would get more nervous. Ebina apologizes for wasting everyone's time and dragging them down, but the girls don't worry about that, and they are determined to find a solution because they are friends. Ebina remembers the first day of school when she noticed others already making friends, so she tried talking to Kiri but upon hearing that Kiri kicked a grown-up guy on the very first day, she got scared. She tried talking to Silfin next but Silfin ended up challenging her to come at her with anything and she will defeat her. Just then, Umaru entered the class and Ebina felt as if Umaru was a princess with all eyes on her. Ebina looked at Silfin, Umaru, and Kiri, wondering if someday one of these could be her friend and now Ebina is back to the present with all three of them being her best friends. With a smile on her face, she tells the girls that she's happy to study with them. The next day, Ebina thinks about her friends to calm herself and secure is above 80 in all subjects. Like that, the group walks back home together. Bamba notices that Kiri is not home and since he is broke after shopping, he decides to head to Taihi's place. Meanwhile, Kiri is with her master, Kumaru enjoying the custard cakes that she brought. Omaru is juggling with the cakes and putting on a show while eating. Just then, Bamba arrives and notices not just Kiri but also the cakes he brought for himself. Taihi and Umaru observe Kiri and Bamba, sitting awkwardly in front of them as if they are not siblings. Just then, Bamba breaks the silence and tells Kiri that it's nice that she's hanging out here and that he's happy that she made a good friend. Umaru thanks Bamba for the cakes and Kiri notices that Bamba is calling Umaru Tanukichi because she looks like a tanuki. Kiri is again devastated at Bamba for disrespecting her master like this. Bamba asks why Kiri addresses her as master and now Kiri is throwing comments at Bamba like like her life is not his concern and he didn't notice her at the aquarium. Taihi, I wants to save his friend but Kiri tells Bamba to unalive himself, so Taihi realizes that Bamba is already done for. Omaru 
Hikaru gives both of them cola to relax, and if there's one thing both the Motoba siblings can agree on is that Umaru is so cute. They all play games together and spend some quality time. Taihi tells Umaru that he's going to Ayoan Mall to buy groceries, so Umaru asks him to bring the latest Fanitsu. Taihi shares that the weather looks bad and her magazine might get wet. Umaru assures him that it won't rain. At the entrance of the mall, Taihi goes through his efficient route, which will be going to the bookstore first, then the Atem, and then to the grocery store. While looking through the bookstore to find the Fanitsu, Taihi runs into Kiri in the storybook section. She immediately runs away, so Taihi figures that he might have caught her at the wrong time. Taihi wraps up his shopping and notices Kiri standing outside because of the heavy rain, which a certain someone said won't happen. Taihi talks to Kiri and notices that she's all gloomy and remembers that she often gets a little down on rainy days. Kiri tells Taihi that she wants to be a storybook author, but she's not good with arts, and she comes to the bookstore to find some help. She thinks that she is nowhere as good as Doma siblings, so she may not be able to fulfill her dream. Taihi tells Kiri that she's really amazing at thinking outside the box, because he only stuck to the route that was right in front of him. He did well in studies and it did pay off, but he never really thought about the future. Kiri reveals that she's writing a book about her master, who has made her so happy and given her a lot of courage, so she wants to share it with others. Taihi is not one who judges other people, so he tells her that she is the only one who can do this. Just then, Umaru comes with a spare umbrella because she felt bad for telling Taihi that it won't rain. On their way back, Umaru notices Taihi smiling, so she asks for the reason and Taihi he answers that sometimes it's good to try different routes. Just then, Taihi I remembers that he had forgotten her Fenitsu because he was so concerned about Kiri. Kiri and Abina conduct another official meeting where Kiri discusses how their various attempts to make her more appealing to Taihi, I have failed, so she has devised another plan to get them together. Just then, Omaru asks them if the skate shoes fit them. The girls are currently at the ice skating center with Taihi. Taihi is worried that some pros are also present, but Umaru tells him not to worry because they separate the pros and amateurs. Kiri's plan is to use the thrill of skating practice and lead it to the thrill of love. She will have Taihi I teach Ebenai how to skate and while they are busy, she will enjoy with her princess Umaru. Just when Kiri thinks that her plan is perfect, Silfen Spahn enters the scene, who wasn't invited, yet here she is. Kiri is waiting for Taihi to help Ebine, but turns out Taihi isn't joining them. Taihi also can't skate, so Umaru helps him while Kiri helps Ebina. Ebina slips and falls while Taihi is already thinking about how things can quickly go downhill and lead to a catastrophe. Meanwhile, Silfen is skating as well as a pro figure skater. Silfen drags Umaru for a challenge and leaves Taihi without support, so he ends up skating to Abina. Abina loses herself and ends up entering the pro skater area, but luckily, Taihi makes sure she doesn't get injured. On their way back, Ebina thanks Kiri for inviting her to skate, while Kiri feels bad because nothing happened for them. Kanao tells Hikari that the dinner is ready, so sometime later, Hikari enjoys the cream stew at Taihi's place. She tells Taihi that this one is much better than what Kanao made, which was a not creamy and totally burnt stew. Kanao told Hikari not to eat whatever this turned out to be, while she ran out to get some food. Taihi also witnessed Kanao's legendary cooking once, so Hikari tells him that she isn't very good when it comes to cooking. Hikari tries asking Taihi to cook at their place someday, but Umaru asks for bread just then, so Taihi I couldn't hear what Hikari said. After dinner, Hikari gets up to leave as she doesn't want Kanao to scold her again. However, she wants Taihi to walk her home, but is trying to muster the courage to ask him. Umaru notices that Hikari is cooking something, so she immediately uses Umaru dive to climb up on Taihi and mark her territory. They go out on the balcony and stare at the stars. Taihi remembers that it was Hikari who he taught about the stars. And Hikari used to stay at home all day when she was a child. The only good thing about her life was her sister Kano. She brought a stuffed toy cat for her one day, and she thought that Kanal was in some weird stuff because she doesn't find this cat cute. A few days later, Kanal comes home with Taiyi. Taiyi Xie greets Hikari nicely, and Kanal brings the recipe book that Taiyi wanted. Hikari noticed Kanao's face was blushing and her smile was brighter. She realized that this was the guy who would marry her sister. This is her type. 
Just as Taihi is about to leave, Hikari stops him and asks him to try her sister's cooking. Two hours later, Kanao wondered how to save herself from the embarrassment while Taihi and Hikari talked about stars. Hikari realized that her sister was strange, and the boy she brought was strange, but he's also her brother now. Back to the present, Hikari hugs Taihi and thanks him for remembering. Umaru notices the happy tears in Hikari's eyes, so she decides to put off the rivalry for a while. Now both his sisters are clinging to him and poor Taiyi. I can't move. Omaru claims that only she can use Omaru Dive, but Hikari claims that it is Hikari Dive. Taihi feels like a mother and along with Umaru, he then walks Hikari back. It's the end of December, so the girls are feeling cold while walking. Umaru holds the hand of Kiri and Abina, saying that it would feel less colder. Silfen joins in as well and now they are standing back to back. The girls feel embarrassed at first, but they decide to enjoy so they all sing the children's song together. Umaru often feels sad at the end of the year, but not this time. Taihi asks Umaru what she wants for dinner, and Umaru comprehends this question as an offer to eat whatever she wants, so she asks for pizza. Taihi thinks about pizza and realizes that the first step would be making a brick oven. He teaches Umaru that she shouldn't always take the easy way out as making things by hand, gives it a taste of its own. Umaru claims that delivered food is also handmade by the people at the restaurant, and she's happy with getting delicious stuff without having to make it herself. Taihi decides to change the thinking process of Umaru tonight. Taihi is all fired up, and while Umaru observes him, the doorbell rings and it's Bamba and Alex. Taihi invited them as well. He puts the dish on the table and announces that today, they are going to eat okonomiyaki. They are all happy to hear, until Umaru realizes that it's not pizza. Taihi informs her that okonomiyaki is Japanese-style pizza, but Umaru refuses to acknowledge it and starts throwing a tantrum. Bamba suggests starting with meat topping, but Alex wants seafood topping, so the authority to make the final decision is given to Umaru. She decides that mixing both is the right way. They are all excited for the first batch and seeing how Omaru's interest is also piqued, Taihi asks her to flip it. Omaru is ready for the revenge match from the time she messed up pancakes. The guys fully encourage Umaru, and with full focus and determination, Umaru manages to flip it perfectly. The guys praise her, and with that, the Umaru special is done. Umaru takes the first bite and announces that it is delicious. She begins melting right in front of them, so Alex offers cola to his sensei and Umaru explodes as a result. They all enjoy okonomiyaki, and Umaru admits that making things herself sure is fun. Omaru shows Taihi an ad in a magazine and asks him to buy this as a Christmas present for her. Taihi couldn't believe that a single game would cost 20,000 yen, so Umaru reveals that it's a limited edition. She judges the situation and things look in her favor. On December 24th, Taihi reveals that he has to work and now Umaru is worried about her present. Taihei assures her that he will buy something on the way back and she should clean up because Ibina will be coming over. Kiri and Silfen had to spend Christmas with their families this time, so it will only be two of them today. Abina is happy to know that Taihi will be happy to see her, and she shares that she hasn't been able to give her a present since his birthday, and she has a lot to thank him for. Umaru realizes that she also has to give a present to Taihi now, so she pretends that she purposely held off buying gifts until Abina came over, so they could go together. Umaru is confused about what to get for Taihei, so she buys a cap for Ibina first. Ibina then hands Omaru the present she bought for her and just like Ibina, it's a cute cap with tiny bear ears. Omaru is enjoying a lot looking for presents for Taiyi, and she never thought that exchanging gifts would be this fun. After work, Taihi enters the mall to buy presents and gets ambushed by the girls who were waiting for him. Omaru shows him the new frying pan she bought for him while Ibina bought an apron for him. Taihi is happy to receive the gifts and now that Ibina is here, he asks her what kind of gift she wants. Kanao shares her impressions about her little sister Hikari, who's a slob and loves bread. More than that, she loves spinning around. On December 22nd, Kanao was sitting at her desk, wondering what her sister seems to be hiding from her. She wonders if Hikari is in that rebellious phase. She puts her head down and remembers the time from 10 years ago when she came home from school and Hikari asked her if her big brother from before would come again. Hikari told her that she wanted to see Taihi again and Kanao informed her that it was only a coincidence. Kanao showed her award of academic excellence to Hikari and told her that she was taking app classes while Taihi was in the regular curriculum. They only became friends at the award ceremony after he gave her so many compliments saying how well she did. Hikari asked if Taihi would praise her too if she got an award, while Kanaa is so happy that fate brought together two geniuses. 
Back to the time when Hikari got the award and showed it to Kano, who was obviously shocked. Hikari tells her that she also wants to be praised. So Kano starts giving her compliments, but Hikari tells her that she wants to be praised by Taihi Wani Chan. Kano was surprised to know that Hikari still remembered it after 10 whole years, so she got up from her desk to get Hikari the greatest Christmas present of all. She approached Taihi's office, but at the last moment, she realized how weird it would seem to ask him to come to her home on Christmas. Eve. Kanal gave up and walked out. She got back home and asked Hikari if she would like to have some cake and watch a movie with her on Christmas. Hikari asked if she was going to rent a movie again like she did last year, and Kanao is now embarrassed. The new year is here, so the girls gather at Sylphen's house in her mother's kimono to celebrate the new year in a wholesome Japanese style. The girls thank Mama Tachibana for the kimonos and enjoy the tasty New Year's feast. Sylphen brings the New Year games she bought for this day, so the girls start with the traditional paddle game. Kiri tries to explain to Sylphen that it may look like tennis, but it's different. But Sylphen doesn't seem to care about all that. Uma Maru and Sylphen form a team against Kiri and Abina, but unfortunately, Sylphen realizes that Sylphen's smash isn't going to work. Kiri wants to get back at her for hugging Umaru, so she introduces a penalty for losers. Sylphen and Kiri decide to go one-on-one -on -one while Ibina sits with Umaru and discusses how fun the new year is. The girls play some games for a while and have the best time of their lives. Umaru receives a 10 grand New Year's allowance from Taihi, 5 from Bamba, 20 from Alex, and even Kiri wants to give, but Umaru declines since they are the same age. She tells Taisei that she wants to save up and spend money like a mature person, so she exchanged all the money for 500 yen coins and put it in her piggy bank. She would have to shake the piggy for each coin, which would restrict her from spending too much. She asks Taihi to make a deposit to her bank too. A few days later, she finds out that the piggy is empty and upon thinking Thinking back, she realizes that there are too many reasons for that. She regrets spending all of it, so Taihi puts a coin to help her get back on track. Umaru tells her that he may not have hobbies or a life, but he should know that 500 yen is nothing in today's economy. She ends up triggering Taihi again, and that's where the story of Himuto ends.